Okay, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the Planning Commission meeting of August 25th, 2016. Ms. Rodriguez, would you call the roll, please? Commissioner Thompson? Here. Commissioner Schwartz? Absent. Commissioner Lodge? Here. Commissioner Jordan? Here. Commissioner Higgins? Here. Vice Chair Peugeot? Here. Chair Campanella? Here. Okay, our next item, uh, Ms. Galarte, are there any requests for continuances, withdrawals, postponements, or addition of X agenda items? There are not, Mr. Chair. Okay, and then also, are there any announcements or appeals to talk about? The only announcement is that the meeting of September 15th, some of those items have postponed, so there will be a cancellation that day. So there will be no Planning Commission meeting on September 15th. Okay. All right. Okay. Our next item is review, consideration, and action on our draft PC minutes and resolutions. This would be of August 11th. Uh, minutes and resolution PC 201.16, 801 Cliff Drive. And I believe we had some changes, Ms. Rodriguez, to the minutes. Yes, you did. I did send those to the, I did send those to the commission, and I don't have them before me at this moment. I have so them. If I can pull them up. You have them? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a request on the resolution on page one of the resolution as you know towards the end of the discussion it was decided um, not to require elimination of the stairs but we didn't correct that in the reso so we want to cross off on page one of the reso non permitted stairs near the street intersection and then in the in on the conditions in the reso on page four we have a comment that any brush clearance shall be performed without the use of mechanized equipment. However, in the monitoring and restoration plan, there's a couple of times when they're allowed to use some mechanized equipment. So we just want to say, unless it's directed by the Honda Valley Monarch Butterfly Habitat Restoration Plan. Okay. okay. And then on page 9, one last change. Sure. Um, condition G1, when um, the commission required that a report be given back to the, to the planning division every three and five years, um, not to the planning, the planning commission. Instead of the applicant, we want the project environmental coordinator. Just correct that. That's it. Okay. Uh, are there any questions from the commissioners? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, B side, just there's a line in there, and I didn't write it down. I didn't mark it, but it's uh, it's the addition of the um, canopy trees and the fence grape plant to the monitoring program mm -hmm. and I just want to make sure that I think I, I always talk too long but that's a nice sentence but what that really meant was that it would fall into that program and it would be monitored and um, monitored for um, appropriate growth and reported on I mean is, is all that kind of sense grabbed in the sentence that you have in there are you comfortable with that I think so okay yeah. perfect I just didn't want to put in there and then nobody really does anything about it. It, right. it was really an intent to make sure that they're being taken care of, they were growing correctly. If they're not growing correctly, then it will rise up to be dealt with. Good. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank okay. You, anything sir. else? If there is no approve, other question. Move to approve the minutes. Second. Yeah. Okay. We have a motion to approve and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, next will be any comments from members of the public uh, on anything other than the item that's on our agenda. Mr. Chair, before you go there, could I just sure. make a comment backwards on um, the announcement of the cancellation of the 15th meeting? Okay. As soon as B sits back down. So I know we're, we're struggling on days, times, and staff schedule for coming back to the joint meeting on getting together for the AUD discussion. And I don't know that everybody, I don't know what the response has been on September 6th or if that's final yet and how that's working for everybody up here, but I know somebody to my left has a problem with that date and I'm just wondering if we could not then look at doing that on the 15th instead if that would still work uh, with more commissioners and or work with staff and I don't, you don't have to have an answer now I just think you can throw that back we'll in the definitely mix. check okay. thank you good good point thank you okay now uh, if there's nothing else up here administratively we'll go to any comments from members of the public do we have any speaker slips Ms. Clarity? For general comments from the public? Okay. Uh, okay, so we have none, so we'll close the public hearing. Uh, next is our agenda item, uh, an application 
uh, for CDP on 1925 El Camino de la Luz. And we'll start with the staff report. Ms. Kennedy, if you will. Yes, thank you, Chair. This is an application for 1925 El Camino de la Luz. The discretionary application is a coastal development permit to allow the proposed development in the appealable jurisdiction of the coastal zone in the city. This is the process timelines. Uh, the application was deemed complete back in... Sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I'm just going to step back here. So the discretionary application is a coastal development permit to allow the proposed development in the appealable jurisdiction of the coastal zone. These are the timelines for the project. The application was deemed complete back in December of last year. The Planning Commission took action and approved the final mitigated negative declara declaration in July. And therefore, there is a action required on the coastal development permit uh, 60 days after adoption of the MND. So that would bring the date to September 8th of this year. This is the project location. Here in yellow is the project site off of El Camino de la Luz. Um, next to the ocean. Here's an aerial view of the project site as well. Uh, the site was previously developed with a single family home. It was two story with a carport uh, back in 1955. In 1978, the landslide that occurred um, destroyed the proper, the, the single family home. And subsequently there was some debris removal, uh, grading, slope st stabilization that occurred. And then some more work was done in 1984 to stabilize the site. This landslide affected this site as well as other sites on either side of the property. Here's a photo of the site from the street looking down the driveway that is associated with the property. And this driveway is shared by the parcel at 1927 El Camino de la Luz to the west. Other existing improvements that are located on the site include uh, some fencing, some vegetation, um, some overhead utility lines. And there's also the Mesa sewer line that uh, cuts across the property at the approximately 128 elevation, um, just beyond where this uh, truck is located here. Here's a view from the beach, uh, 1925 parcel is located here and up over to this uh, general vicinity. The proposed project, uh, which would be located on this 20,000 square foot lot, uh, is a new proposed uh, 2,700 square foot three-story single-family residence. This is in the West Mesa neighborhood. It's in the Hillside Design District. As I said, it's in the appealable jurisdiction of the coastal zone. The average slope of the whole site uh, together is about 37%. Um, the site itself varies from uh, about 12 and a half feet here at the driveway to about 50 feet wide at the rest, for the rest of the property here. Uh, as I said, the proposal's for a, about a 2,700 square foot house with an attached uh, 571 square foot two car garage. The house itself would be located in this area here at the end of the driveway. Uh, this is between the approximately the 80 and 130 foot elevations on the site. So if you look at this site plan, uh, the beach is down this way and the, the street is over here. The average slope of the proposed development um, area is approximately 27 percent. and That would be in this area here. The driveway would be widened. Uh, somewhat in this area um, here through a easement um, with the adjacent property in 1921 El Camino de la Luz. The project also includes a driveway turnaround area. So the cars would drive down here into the, the driveway and then back up in the turnaround area and head out uh, this way. This shows a, uh, where the proposed construction staging areas would be along the driveway here in pink and also on the adjacent property 
um, right here at 1921 El Camino de la Luz. The project also includes some offers to dedicate easements. Uh, there's an open space easement offer over this portion of the property from the development down to the beach um, over the um, these areas here. There's a mitigation area for lemonade, berry plantings, um, open space here, and open space over on the um, lower cliff area. There's also an offer to dedicate um, the back beach area, some area here on the beach for lateral public access for the public. And then there's another offer to dedicate open space, um, excuse me, airspace over the development looking from the beach. And I'll actually move to another slide to show you that. Um, if you are standing here at the street, you'd be looking out over the project and be able to see the ocean and islands beyond. Okay, going back to the elevations, uh, these elevations were reviewed by the Single Family Design Board and received positive comments. Here are the site sections. Um, for construction, there'll be some slope stabilization measures, uh, implementation of the geotechnical report that's uh, part of the project description. It would uh, include uh, deep caissons, um, grade beams, tiebacks, um, and such to stabilize the area and the surrounding area. Here's a landscape plan that's proposed um, that you can see the new landscaping in this area along the driveway and around the house. These are the proposed floor plans for the project. Uh, it's a three level, it's the garage on the, the upper level and then a two um, living levels on level lower level one and two. Again, just another diagram about the showing the deep caissons and how this will be um, constructed in the grading for the project. The project was reviewed by the single family design board on two occasions when they went in February, there were uh, many concerns regarding the mass bulk and scale of the project and the applicant went back, made some revisions, and the board stated that the revised project did address all their concerns and that the reduced size and then the, uh, the architecture and other design elements complied with the city guidelines. They provided a 20 closest home study as part of the SFDB review. Uh, this is what they turned in. These are the homes here that were included in it, and it just shows that um, this here, this is the um, proposed project, although this was before it was reduced in size somewhat, so this may change a little bit, but um, ranked in size, it was um, number four here in the neighborhood, and then as far as FAR, um, it was a bit lower, number 13 uh, ranking in the area. So it is um, consistent with other sizes of residences in this neighborhood. The project does meet all zoning ordinance requirements for the E3 zone in regard to the setbacks, the building height, parking requirements, and open yard requirements. As you know, we went through environmental review with the project. The final MND was adopted by the commission in July. Uh, the conclusions were that there were, would be potentially significant impacts related to biological resources, geology, and noise, but that those could be mitigated to a less than significant level. So those mitigation measures to reduce the, um, the impacts to less than significant have been added to the conditions of approval before you today. We did provide you with an addendum that was prepared and that was uh, to respond to comments that we received just prior to the hearing that hadn't been previously responded to um, or other comments um, at the hearing itself. And that is uh, attached to the MND and part of your packet. There were some recommended measures identified in the environmental document. These are not mitigation measures, but they were measures identified to further reduce less than significant impacts. Those listed here, um, B1, B2, N5, and 6, and uh, water quality were all suggested in the um, MND, and the applicant has agreed to uh, 
these conditions, so these may be added to the conditions of approval. They were not actually physically put in the condition set, so if you would like to add those, that could be something you could add to your motion later. The applicant has opposed the other recommended measures, however, in, in regard to noise. Uh, there were three others that they have not agreed to, and if um, you'd like, we can discuss that later. So the project does require some findings, um, and I'd like to talk about the, the consistency findings in regard to policies of the Coastal Act and local coastal plan. The Coastal Act policy sections that we'll talk about are these here. <coughs> Excuse me. In regard to public access, existing development, visual qualities, and hazards. Coastal Act Section 30212 is in regard to public access, uh, stating that the project should provide new public access um, unless there's adequate access nearby. And in this case, there is. There's access at Mesa Lane, Shoreline Park, and other areas in um, the vicinity. So this project can be found consistent with that policy. New residential development should be located in existing developed areas. That's the case in this in this case, it is located in a developed neighborhood, so the proposal can be found consistent with this policy as well. Scenic and visual qualities of coastal areas shall be protected, uh, minimize alteration of natural landforms, uh, be visually compatible with the surrounding area. Uh, the proposal does include a dedication of airspace, uh, public view corridor easement, um, so from the street, there'll be a view of the ocean that's maintained, and it has been determined to be compatible with um, the neighborhood uh, during design review. So this proposal can be found consistent with this policy as well. In regard to hazards, Coastal Act Section 30253 states that new development shall minimize risks to life and property in areas of high geologic flood and fire hazard. It shall assure stability and structural integrity and neither create nor contribute significantly to erosion, geologic instability, or destruction of the site or the surrounding area or in any way require the construction of protective devices that would substantially alter natural landforms along bluffs and cliffs. So the proposal does include uh, numerous recommendations in the geology reports uh, in regard to caissons, shear pins, and tieback installation. Uh, the project would minimize risk to life and property, and it would assure uh, stability of the project in the surrounding area as required by the policy. So this proposal has been found to be consistent with this policy. There are local coastal plan policies as well, and these are discussed. There's just a list here of those that I'll be talking about in regard to public access. Like uh, I said previously, um, it, is, it does comply with the public access policy. The proposal does include a dedication of area on the beach um, for public access, and this proposal can be found to be consistent with this LCP policy. New development must be compatible with the neighborhood and not overburden uh, on-street parking. That's the case with this project. It received positive design review comments, and it does include the two-car garage that's required under the ordinance. The policy can be found consistent with this policy. Policy 6.1 states that the city shall protect, preserve, and where feasible, restore biotic communities. This project does include a dedication of open space area over a large portion of the site uh, south of the developed portion, and the proposal can be found consistent with this policy as well. In regard to visual quality, existing views to and from and along the beach uh, and the coastal areas shall be protected, preserved, and enhanced. Again, this proposal includes a dedication of the air space uh, view corridor easement over the project site that's from, looking from the street towards the ocean, and the proposal can be found consistent with this policy as well. Also, undergrounding utilities uh, is required, and they're consistent with this policy of um, undergrounding where um, appropriate. LCP policy 8.1 hazards all new development of bluff top land shall have drainage systems carrying runoff away from the bluff to the nearest public street. In this case, the project has uh, extensive drainage um, components, uh, does comply with the city stormwater management plan requirements, and therefore the project can be found consistent with this policy. 
LCP policy 8.2, also in regard to hazards, states that no development shall be permitted on the bluff face except drainage systems that we just uh, just talked about and other access ways for um, public access. In order to determine whether the proposal is on the bluff face, the location of the top of bluff or bluff edge must be determined. We've talked about this at previous hearings, um, but this is the important um, determination to be made to determine whether this project is consistent with this policy. We looked at the bluff edge definition, which is here. Um, I'd like to just uh, point out the last um, sentence here. In a case where there is a step light feature at the top of the cliff face, the landward edge of the topmost riser shall be taken to be the cliff edge. And this is um, essentially what we use to determine, or, or staff has used to determine the top of bluff or bluff edge location. So staff used a number of um, references in regard to determining the bluff edge. We used the memo prepared by Coastal Commission staff entitled Establishing Development Setbacks from Coastal Bluffs. We re reviewed the topography. We attended a site visit with Coastal Commission staff. We looked at uh, topographic data. We reviewed archive plans for surrounding parcels where top of bluff was identified at a, an upper area similar to this project. We reviewed prior geology reports and other plans that identified the landslide headscarp as the bluff edge. We examined a minimum 50-foot wide area. We do recognize that the location is a qualitative judgment, and this is um, and also open to interpretation, and this is uh, recognized by the Coastal Commission as well. Uh, we did receive a recent confirmation memo from the Coastal Commission staff geologist confirmed um, our determination of the top of bluff. Um, here's just a exhibit that's included in your packet uh, showing the various slopes in this area and um, showing that in this particular area, this, uh, very steep slopes. And we looked at a 500-foot wide uh, width here, which is the screen line, and used this in our evaluation. And... This is just an excerpt from the memo, uh, page four, if you want to read more about it. But this is um, an excerpt from Mark Johnson's memo uh, in regard to determining the top of bluff at this specific site. He stated that I identify the bluff edge as that point where the downward gradient of the surface increases more or less continuously until it reaches the general gradient of the cliff. It is clear to me that the intent of, and the definition of bluff edge, is specifically to conservatively include the upper, more gently sloping areas of the bluff above the more often prominent sea cliff below. And the memo also includes information from a court case that demonstrates that a similar uh, memo entitled Geotechnical Review Memorandum regarding a bluff edge determination is considered substantial evidence in support of such determinations made by the Coastal Commission. So we are uh, in part relying on his um, evaluation. And this shows where we are. The bluff edge per staff is in this area about 127 foot elevation. And as you know, the applicant has um, asserted that it's down here at this lower edge. Uh, beca because staff says it here, this area below would be called the bluff face, and hence we have this um, inconsistency with the policy. Again, no development shall be permitted on the bluff face. Uh, the proposal, if the top of bluff is determined to be at 127, the proposal would be located on the, on the bluff face and therefore cannot be found consistent with this policy. However, in the Coastal Act, it states that it shall not be construed as authorizing any decision-making bodies acting pursuant to this division to this Coastal Act to exercise their power to grant or deny a permit in a manner which will take or damage private property for public use without the payment of just compensation, therefore. So in this case, the Planning Commission can approve a project while not fully consistent with all coastal policies, but that would be consistent with coastal policies to the extent feasible. Planning Commission may require revisions to the proposed project while still allowing the applicant reasonable economic use of the land. 
And unless the proposal would be a public nuisance or safety hazard, the Planning Commission may not deny all economic use of the land. Staff has determined that there really is no alternative location on the property for a reasonable level of development that would satisfy all coastal policies. Any alternative to reduce the scale of the project in the same location would also be inconsistent with this policy 8.2 because that development would also be on the bluff face even if it were reduced in size. So we, as you know, in the staff report cons uh, includes a number of findings. Um, so I've included all the findings here. There are 10, there's a number of them, but um, I'm just gonna go through them rather quickly just to um, bring them to your attention. And these are the, uh, the findings that need to be made to approve this project. So as we said, the project uh, is consistent with the policies of the California Coastal Act in regard to public access, in regard to protection of coastal resources, location within an existing developed area, protection of scenic and visual qualities of coastal areas, and minimizing risks due to the geologic hazards. Finding two would be that the project is consistent with the city's LCP policies regarding access, housing, biological resources, geologic hazards, and visual quality, all applicable implementing guidelines and all applicable provisions of the code. The proposed project complies with the applicable zoning requirements. The single family design board found the proposed site location, mass, bulk and scale, architecture and landscape design of the project to be appropriate per city design guidelines. The proposed project is similar in size to other, other residences in the surrounding neighborhood. They have a 75% of the maximum guideline FAR um, proposed. The project is inconsistent with LCP policy 8.2 that we just discussed because the top of bluff has been determined to be at 127 and the proposed project would therefore be located lower, which would be on the bluff face. The Planning Commission considered alternative locations for development of a residence and determined that no feasible alternative location for the residence, similar in size to other residences in the surrounding neighborhood has been identified in the project site that would make this project consistent with 8.2. And this is based on the following. We have two alternatives um, that we're presenting that were evaluated. There's an area of 740 square feet. That's above the 127 elevation. It's between the existing driveway and the proposed building. So that area would not be on the bluff face. However, it's not geologically stable. If it were located there, it would block uh, public views of the ocean from the street because it would be above that area. It appears that it would not be sufficient in size for a single family home with a garage and it would not provide reasonable economic use of the land. The other area that we looked at was a uh, 1300 square foot area. It would be though 12 and a half feet wide by 105 feet long. It's not in the bluff phase. It would be geologically stable. That is the area sort of on the portion of the driveway that's stable. However, it would be too narrow to meet any kind of uh, city development standards. It would block the views because it's above that 127 elevation and it would not provide reasonable economic use of the land. The proposed project is consistent with LCP policies to the extent feasible. The Planning Commission finds that the approval of the proposed project, despite inconsistency with LCP policy 8.2, to be necessary in order to avoid a potential taking a private property without compensation pursuant to the uh, section 30010. And then we've added the environmental finding that the MND adopted by the Planning Commission together with the addendum that's before you today demonstrates that the project as designed and with the mitigation measures uh, would not result in significant impacts. Therefore, our recommendation is that the Planning Commission approve the CDP project, make the findings outlined in the report and subject to the conditions of approval as revised. The, we did send the conditions to the um, applicant and they returned with a number of uh, requested 
revisions and additions to the conditions. Staff reviewed them, and then we put together what we thought we would find acceptable. We provided you with those conditions with track changes. So that's the most recent version, and um, we'd like you to look at those and determine whether those track changes and just in general those conditions are acceptable to you. Um, We'd also want to add the recommended mitigation measures that I, excuse me, not mitigation, recommended measures for the MND that have not been added yet. Um, we recommend that those be added, those, um, the four that I spoke of previously. Also, it was a request that I provide you with the possible actions based on today. Um, if it, there's an approval or denial by the Planning Commission, it would be appealable to Council. Uh, if there's a denial by Council, that would not be appealable to the Coastal Commission. However, if there's an approval by Council, that would be appealable to the Coastal Commission. That is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm here for questions later on in the hearing. Thank you. Um, do the commissioners have any questions they need to be asked right now, or can we wait for the applicant's presentation and ask questions then? Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll have the presentation from the applicant. We've allotted 35 minutes. Of course, if there's any questions afterwards, uh, that's uh, on our time, not yours. So, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Commissioner Campanella and Commissioners. I'm Clay Arell with AB Design Studio, architect for the project. Um, I have a brief slideshow. Do you mind? Uh, can somebody give me a three-minute warning, maybe? Because um, I want to leave enough time for the rest of the team. I'll watch it. I'll, I'll take a look. Um, this is a site plan drawing here that you've, you've already seen a couple times. Um, I'm not going to go through a lot of the design of the project because that's really being handled by the single-family design board who's been in support. Um, but I just wanted to go through a couple of these slides. This is our site plan. Um, Kathleen did a great job explaining the project for us. So just to see, I got this right. Is this working? Good. Um, so as you know, El Camino de la Luz and the project site, um, and then the the building going here. Um, Pat Shires from Cotton Shires will be talking more about the the structure and the geology and, and why this is located here. So I won't get in too much depth, and we've talked about it in the past. Um, let's see if I can make this work. There we go. Um, just a visual we created for this presentation is uh, if the bluff face uh, was considered to be the entire project and the top of bluff was at 127, that would leave this red portion roughly what uh, Ms. Kennedy was talking about as a buildable portion of the land. Um, that's what it looks like in terms of a site plan. Uh, and we thought we'd bring that just as a demonstration of uh, how infeasible that would be to build on. <clears throat> Again, here's our site sections. Um, Kathleen did a great job explaining these, but just for the sake of reiterating, uh, this red line that you see here, there's a person standing on El Camino de la Luz. We have dedicated that airspace, everything above that line, uh, as, as public view access. So um, we have nestled the building into the site quite a bit. Um, you can see the shear pins and the tiebacks uh, and the structure that will be here that will strengthen the actual landform that's there today, uh, which is a benefit. So our project not only uh, is sitting into the site and, and not be viewed from the public way at all, uh, it's also uh, helping strengthen the landform, which I think is a benefit. Um, from the beach side, this is another person here, uh, average size human, standing on the mean high tide line and looking up towards the project. And from this diagram, you can see that uh, you really can't see the house at all um, from this vantage point. And we have other exhibits that I'm going to show related to that. Uh, this being one of them, this would be the view from uh, the section that I just showed you a moment ago. Um, that would be somebody standing on the beach looking up at the bluff. Here's the bluff, top of bluff here, and the bluff face here, uh, and the lemonade berry stand that... that starts at this point and runs up the top of the hill. Uh, this is a large, I believe, cedar tree over here next to 1909, uh, El Camino de la Luz. Um, but from this vantage point, you really can't see any homes, uh, especially ours. 
This is looking northwest from the southeast and looking again up at the bluff. Here's the bluff face. Top of bluff is up in here underneath that lemonade berry stand. Um, you can see a house sort of in the distance. I can't remember the address right now. It's down the, it's down the way. I think it's on Edgewater. This is an Edgewater house, 2001, I think. Um, and then uh, this uh, existing vegetation, which will remain, uh, blocks any views of our house. This is looking northeast from the southwest. Again, uh, we're looking up at the site. Our property is in this general vicinity. Um, here's the lemonade berry stand, and there's nothing you can see back, back in there. So, um, uh, we provided this. This is a, a, a photograph that you saw earlier, but we've um, added in our driveway widening um, in the existing homes here on the right. Uh, and what our driveway would look like. And there's a house down there, but you can't see the roof. So this is the visual from standing roughly in the middle of El Camino de la Luz, looking out over the water. Uh, and our home is down below the edge, this horizon line of the driveway that you see here. Um, so there's an unimpeded view of the um, ocean and the islands, if you can see them. <clears throat> Um, we've also added a couple exhibits here. This is the house as we've designed it, nestled into our site. Uh, this viewpoint is looking from 1933, ECDLL, rough elevation I have written down uh, at uh, eye level at about 136 point, uh, feet 8. And the top of the roof of our building here, which you see in this, in this image, is at 129 foot 6. So our the height of our roof, the highest point of our project is uh, below the finished floor of this house. Uh, in addition, you can see how our house is stepped down, um, nestled into the site with this vegetation and the natural landform of the coast and the top of bluff down here. You can see that our home really isn't taking away any ocean views from our neighbors um, from this vantage point. Uh, this is another slide we prepared. There's a house in there. Um, you can see it kind of right in there. There's some of the windows that you would see. Uh, this is more or less from 1909 viewing towards our property with the large uh, trees and vegetation, vegetated growth, which makes it very uh, non-visible from that vantage point either. So we looked at it looking, I showed you at it looking from the west to the east, and this is from the east to the west. Um, and this was a slide that was brought up earlier, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. There's been a lot of uh, public comment and concern about the size of the house um, it, as it being big or too large or, or what have you. Um, this is a study we did for the Single Family Design Review Board. As you can see, the project in terms of FAR related to other pro properties in the neighborhood, and for those who don't know, FAR is the floor area ratio of build, built floor area to size of site. Um, this number is on the low middle part of the spectrum, 13 out of 21, or 20, excuse me. Uh, and then in terms of size, you know, there's, there's some bigger houses and smaller houses in this neighborhood. That's how things happen over time. So uh, our home right here is sitting in this orange line. It's the fourth largest in the neighborhood. You've got 2007 Edgewater at 6,000. Uh, and I will point out that 1930, 1926, El Camino de la Luz, directly across the street from our property, our driveway, are considerably larger by almost a thousand feet. Um, so you know, we're in this lower bracket, you will, if you will, of, of size of homes. Uh, so it's not a, it's not too large for the neighborhood, and it, it's in keeping with the existing neighborhood context. So I'm going to stop and let the guys go next. Thank you. I'm here for questions if you need it. Yep. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Campanella and members of the Commission and Ms. Kennedy. Uh, my name is Steve Kaufman. I'm co-counsel with Mr. Monk for the applicant. My expertise is regulation under the California Coastal Act. And from uh, 77 to 91, uh, I represented the Commission while I was in the uh, Attorney General's office. And since then, I've represented a state agency, a whole bunch of local governments. I actually represented the city at one point. Uh, developers and landowners in, in matters involving the Commission. My comments today again relate to the 
question of where the coastal bluff edge on this parcel is located. And this is an issue that we have discussed with you previously in the environmental review process, but it's not really a CEQA issue. Uh, today, though, it's squarely before you on this CDP application, so we need to address it. The coastal bluff edge is at between elevation 48 and 52 feet, mean low, low water, not at approximately 127 feet, uh, as your staff report and the commission's geologists have suggested. No part of the residential development is proposed on the bluff face. The residence is set back a minimum of 169 feet uh, from the coastal bluff edge, and it's for that reason that the project is consistent with policy 8-2. Uh, there are several ways to demonstrate that, uh, and I'd like to do that for you now. And I want to begin with the applicable policies of the Coastal Act, because sections 30251 and 30253, and I think uh, Kathy uh, quoted uh, 30253 for you, they protect natural landforms. That's because that's the coastal resource, uh, not a landslide. And here, the subject slope consists of two parts, it has an upper slope, or the headscarp of the 78 landslide it was created in part by some actions by the city, and that's at approximately 127 feet, and by no definition is that a natural landform. The lower portion, though, where the bluff edge has been identified at between elevations 48 to 52 feet is a natural landform to the extent that marine erosion and wind erosion uh, control the slope gradient. Now, today you'll hear from Pat Shires, who's doing an excellent job for me, and I appreciate it. Uh, Cotton Shires mapped the coastal bluff edge at uh, 48 to uh, 52 feet, mean, low, low water. It's a specific datum. And that determination was based on a detailed topographic survey, careful review of historic topographic mapping, and a review of, uh, of the uh, aerial photographic record of the area. A lot of work went into that analysis by Cotton Shires, and uh, Pat can uh, amplify on that for you. That coastal bluff edge determination was based on all of the criteria in the Commission's adopted regulation, Section 13577H, and the Commission's guidelines for the geologic stability of bluff top development. And again, as I mentioned, the proposed residence is set back a minimum of 169 feet from that surveyed bluff edge. The staff report and, and Kathleen make reference to a bluff edge determination made by Mark Johnson, who is a Coastal Commission staff geologist. And, his determination of the bluff edge at 127 feet was based on about a 15-minute site observation in January 2013. His recent memo provided to you and uh, your staff notes that the slope was modified by the 78 landslide and additionally by grading uh, by the city. He incorrectly states that the topography could have come about by gradual erosion related to the sea cliff, but there's no evidence at all to support that. And as I'll show you in a moment, he identified his bluff edge on a graphic as what appears as a pimple, if you will, on the slope as opposed to the clear angular feature at the top of the cliff face identified by Cotton Shires. Mark's analysis didn't discuss a step-like feature, the 500 length requirement in the Commission's regulation, or the 10-foot vertical height requirement in the Commission's guideline. Now, for a while now, in fact, for a couple of years, your staff has referred to a 2002 conference paper that Mark wrote as a guideline. At the last hearing, we explained it's definitely not a guideline, so staff said, well, maybe it's guideline with a little g, but frankly, it's neither of those things. And it's just a paper that was written for a conference. I just wrote a paper for a, a conference, and nobody's going to attribute something substantial to me, I can assure you. Uh, he stated at the beginning of, of his paper, the opinions expressed herein are those of the author and do not reflect a formal position of the Coastal Commission. And Mark provided the paper to the, the Commission, uh, and in his cover memo he explained, and I, I would like to read this to you, we haven't done this before, this methodology does not represent a formal policy or position of the Coastal Commission. In fact, there may be other appropriate methodologies to establish development setbacks, and the Commission has the discretion to base a decision on any method that it finds technically and legally valid. The Commission then makes its decision on a case-by-case -case basis based upon site-specific evidence related to the particular development proposal. Now, I agree with that. The paper says we look at the natural bluff. I agree with that. But the paper doesn't discuss the 500-foot requirement or the 10-foot vertical requirement and the guidelines. 
Now, I have to emphasize to you, and you know this when you drive up and down the coast, that not every slope landform on the California coast is a coastal bluff. The regulation that the Commission adopted requires that the landform have a 500-foot minimum length. If, if that weren't the case, Pat Shires couldn't do his job. He wouldn't know what to do. It would be an ad hoc exercise, if you will, and every landform on the coast could potentially be a coastal bluff. But in crafting this regulation, the Commission staff report in 1979, which Mark attached to his recent memo says, the staff continues to believe that the Commission should avoid treating every bluff in the coastal zone as a coastal bluff. So the regulation sets forth three different uh, coastal bluff criteria. One, where the top edge of the bluff, uh, of the cliff, is rounded away from the cliff face. Two, where there's a step-like feature at the top of the cliff face. And three, where coastal bluff transition inlands, uh, transitions inland to a canyon bluff. And then the last sentence of the regulation, and I want to point that out to you because Kathy quoted a portion of the regulation but left this out. 500 feet shall be the minimum length of the bluff line or edge to be used in making these determinations. Note that it says determinations, meaning all of them, not just one. And Cotton Shires mapped the headscarp, and it's less than 300 feet in length, which was a question Commissioner Thompson raised in our first hearing. Well, the bluff edge mapped at 42, I'm sorry, 48 to 52 feet is greater than 500 feet in length. So for this reason, commissioners, the headscarp doesn't qualify as the coastal bluff edge. The commission's regulations don't define what is a step-like feature. But the Commission's guidelines for the geologic stability of uh, bluff top development do show a step-like feature at the top of the cliff to have a minimum vertical height of 10 feet, and you can see that off to the left uh, from this graphic in the guidelines. But there is no 10-foot vertical height escarpment of this property landward of Cotton Shire's surveyed coastal bluff edge. And as I said, uh, Mark's recent memo doesn't address this requirement. By contrast, the 10-foot vertical feature is necessarily at uh, Cotton Shire's bluff edge of 48 to 52 feet, not the 127-foot elevation. And again, this is, you need to have a standard that everybody can understand and follow. Without this standard, any rise, however small, could result in a coastal bluff edge. So again, the headscarp commissioners doesn't qualify as the edge of the coastal bluff. Now this is the diagram that Mark Johnson used in his recent memo. It wasn't prepared by him, it was prepared by Cotton Shires. And what you see in yellow and the callouts there, uh, Mark added, uh, on the left, the bluff edge per the applicant, on, and on the right, the bluff edge per Mark. Uh, and what I want you to understand is this. If in Mark's view, as reflected on this figure, if it were correct, every ripple on a slope in the coastal zone would constitute a coastal bluff edge no matter how far removed it is from the top of the cliff face, which here is about 250 feet. Now, Mark also uh, cited to an unpublished California Court of Appeal decision in Norberg versus the Coastal Commission because it relied on uh, a determination he made in that case. Uh, and Kathy referenced that as well. Now, it's unpublished. That means it can't be cited or relied upon. And if you look at the opinion, it punctuates that rule right at the beginning of the document. Either the court felt it wasn't a significant principle or that it should be confined to its peculiar facts and not treated or cited in the future as precedent. Most importantly, Norberg factually was just very different. There the applicant cut uh, into or filled to the, uh, onto the uh, top of the coastal bluff to install uh, landscaping walls uh, within 30 feet horizontally and 50, 15 feet vertically at the top of the bluff edge. Here, we have no rounding issue. Uh, we don't have a step-like feature at the top of the cliff. We don't have the applicant cutting into the, the uh, slope. We have a property affected by a landslide. And under Section 30625 of the Coastal Act, local government decisions are supposed to be guided by coastal commissions. And here, uh, this is unusual. We have one right on point. That's Doolittle, which the commission approved in 1984 to approve a grading associated with that uh, 78 landslide. And the commission in Doolittle distinguished, excuse me, distinguished between the headscarp of the 78 landslide there and as it extended onto the subject property. And it defined the coastal bluff edge on this parcel at approximately uh, elevations 48 to 51 feet, noting the bluff edge to be seaward of the headscarp. 
So it, it distinguished between the coastal bluff and the landsc landslide headscarp, and it was based on a, a detailed site inspection, documented photos of the bluff face, and the 78 landslide. So commissioners based on Doolittle, the headscarp is not the bluff edge. Now, having said all that, Mr. Chairman, we have two requests today. The first is for staff to modify the coastal bluff edge determination to be at 48 to 52 feet, mean low, low water, because that's the only expert uh, coastal bluff edge uh, location based on the correct application of the controlling criteria and the Commission's regs, its guidelines, and the decision do little. And you don't have to strain to avoid an unconstitutional taking. And there's really no reason why the city of Santa Barbara has to be the one to make that determination. And the residents, as I said, will have a minimum 169-foot setback. It's not on a coastal bluff face, and therefore the project is consistent with LUP policy 8-2. Our second request is for changes to a couple of conditions. And our letter, uh, Exhibit 4, redlined a number of condition changes we were requesting, and frankly, we just want to thank staff. Uh, it was an arduous exercise, I'm sure, to go through our changes, and uh, at this point, uh, we really have only two changes to, to request of you. First, related to uh, my presentation today, we ask that you direct staff to delete references and the conditions to the Bluff Edge and Policy 8-2 uh, project inconsistency that's just not supported by substantial evidence in the record before you. And second, we ask that you delete condition 1, capital D, 1D, and eliminate the, uh, eliminate the limitations on construction-related uh, truck trip times because you've now adopted an environmental document. You went through a public hearing on that and the whole purpose of that document and exercise was to address issues like this and that document makes clear that there's no evidence of potentially significant environmental traffic effects. So there's no nexus for this condition. That's really the one condition that we'd ask you to change today. And I'd like to wrap up my comments by highlighting that this project We'll have several significant public benefits for the city. We've cited five here. Uh, slope stabilization increases the factor of safety for the Mesa Trunk Line sewer, the neighborhood uh, electric utility line, and I think importantly, the adjacent neighboring residences. Uh, it will provide a public view, which uh, a corridor, which Clay showed you from the street to the Santa Barbara Channel and Santa Cruz Island, provide uh, uh, stored clean stormwater for reuse by the fire department and the public works department and then two others. It will provide an offer to dedicate an open space easement, and it will also provide an offer to dedicate a lateral public beach access easement. And in my world, that's important. This is a house that doesn't have any burden or impact on public access. Under cases that you've probably heard, the Nolan case and the Dolan case, you probably couldn't impose that kind of a requirement. Even if you have language in the, uh, in the LCP that says, thou shalt do it, the, the, Supreme Court in Nolan said, no, you've got to have an impact, and you don't. But it will be achieved here, and that's an important public amenity. So with that, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, uh, thank you, and I'd like to uh, introduce Pat Shires from Cotton Shires. Good afternoon. I'm Pat Shires, uh, the geotechnical engineer for this project. Um, just want to give you a little more of my background to start out with. Uh, I'm usually on the other side of the fence here. We, we do a lot of work for the cities and municipalities. We are the city geologist and city geotechnical consultant for uh, the city of Malibu, the city of Santa Monica, and uh, the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, city of Rolling Hills Estates. Uh, in Southern California and, and 18 cities in Northern California, including Pacifica, uh, which is right on the ocean. 
Uh, we have offices in Thousand Oaks, in Los Gatos, and in San Andreas. I came down here this morning from San Andreas, which is near Sacramento. Uh, we have spent, uh, well, I think the reason I wanted to bring that up is consequently we're more conservative than your average consultant. So we spend a lot of time making sure that projects we work on are going to be as safe as possible. And in this case, we were spent hundreds and hundreds of hours on this project since 2008 uh, doing all kinds of analyses, uh, mainly slope stability analyses and hydrology analyses to make sure that this project was going to be stable in the end and it, that it was going to uh, take care of all the water. And we use state-of-the-art programs and methodology to do that. Today I'd like to cover three points. Uh, I want to do a little more response to Mark Johnson's uh, memo. I also want to respond to the city staff determination of the Bluff Edge briefly and cover some of the beneficial impacts of the slope stability that this project is, is proposing and address some of the neighbors' concerns about uh, construction-related activities. Uh, the city asked Mark Johnson to address three items. They needed a staff report that he referenced in a slideshow. Uh, they also wanted reports that reference guidelines to illustrate how the Coastal Commission applies their uh, bluff top determinations consistently throughout the state. Very important thing. I, I can see why they wanted that. And they also wanted him to explain the top of bluff analysis he performed for this site. He provided this December uh, 79 staff report, uh, but in terms of staff reports to illustrate consistency, he did not pl uh, uh, provide any of those. Uh, he, instead, he pro provided that appellate court decision on a case which is nothing like this case. Uh, the process of his brief bluff top analysis was explained, and he concluded that the top edge of the steep cliff face was at uh, the top edge of the steep cliff face at elevation 50 feet was rounded away. Uh, up to an elevation of 127 feet, about 250 feet back from the cliff, the cliff face. And to do that, he used our cross-section, AA prime. Uh, do you have your pointer? Yeah. Or... Okay. So this is AA prime. It cuts right through the center of the lot we're talking about today. And he uh, indicated that the that this is what we call the bluff edge, that it really should be up here. And if you look at his slideshow, in cases where the top edge of the bluff cliff is rounded away, it's usually right at the bluff face. In fact, that's what the language says, at the steep cliff. And so you, if it's rounded away at the top, you pick that point where it's rounded away at most. Otherwise, it's got to increase continuously until it reaches the gradient of the cliff. This is the gradient of the cliff. So this has to always be increasing until it gets to this point. And it doesn't do that. I, I don't understand it. Uh, to me, it's, this part isn't rocket science. This is very easy to understand and should be applied based on the regulations and the guidelines. I mean, do you think this looks more like this, or does it look more like that? I, I think it looks more like this, and that's pretty much how simple it is. The flaws in his analysis are that he doesn't provide any examples of how the Coastal Commission bluff top determinations were provided to show consistency with previous determinations, even though that's what the city wanted. He didn't give them that. He didn't uh, provide, or he, the reasoning he used in making his determination is not supported by the regulations or the guidelines. Uh, he didn't follow those guidelines. He equates rounding away from the face of the cliff as a result of erosional processes related to the presence of the steep cliff with landslide processes of a dip slope landslide triggered by heavy rainfall and diverted city runoff. Those are not the same things. This is not in the, the guidelines or the re regulations of the Coastal Commission. He points to rounding when topographically there is no rounding. The gra downward gradient of the surface does not increase more or less continuously until it reaches the general gradient of the cliff. The city, on their hand, is making a different argument for the top of bluff, and that's the step-like feature. There's two exceptions to the break, uh, uh, steep break and slope, and one of those is the rounding, the other is the step-like feature. The city is using LIDAR data uh, to, from a UCSB student 
uh, paper uh, to determine that, that there's red areas up in here, so therefore there must be a steep cliff because there's red areas down here where it's steep. Well, there's some flaws with this map, and I can point those out right now. First of all, it breaks down all the categories of slope going you know, in, 10, in increments of 10% from 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, and all of a sudden, boom, everything over 50 is one color. Well, that makes everything look steep that's over 50% when maybe there's tons of variations. So we went back and looked at that. And yeah, if you break it down, if you break those upper categories down into other 10% uh, increments, you get a very different looking picture. You don't get that, the big red lines up in here. You get a, a melange of colors that are lighter than the red, which is uh, bluff faces, which most of these are 110 to 120 or steeper. And you get, these are roughly half of that up in this area where the elevation 127 contour is. So you really need to, to look at the right kind of data. And again, here's what the uh, Mark Johnson slideshow so, shows. If you have a step-like feature, it's got to be at the top of the cliff face. At the top. That is the top of the cliff face. The step has to be at that top or you know, near enough to be considered that it's at it. And in fact, uh, this one is 250 feet away where, where the uh, city is now making a determination. And so if you look at the height in his diagram, this is one, this is a half, so it's half to one. If you look at this diagram, this is 6.25 to one. So it's way further back from at the top of the bluff face. Oops. And again, you have the criteria from the guidelines in 1977. Uh, they, they show a 20-degree angle here, which is the area of, of uh, demonstration which, and a 50-foot minimum going back. Here's the 50 foot min here's 50 feet right here, and here's the area of demonstration from that 20-degree angle. So it breaks out a slope right here. So the, the area where they're putting this is even outside of what you're supposed to demonstrate according to the guidelines. Now I want to talk about the stability of the site and what this project does for the stability of the site. First of all, the upslope stability is increased from the shear pins and tiebacks. This is a diagram showing all the shear pins here individually and uh, another row of shear pins here. And then these shear pins have tiebacks between them that go into the slope and have a whaler that uh, locks them all in so that the stability of this area is enhanced. And we have foundation piers shown individually in between these in several rows. And so what that does is it not only affects the stability of the, of the building itself, but it goes out from that and it goes up from that. And so we've got the Mesa trunk sewer line coming through here. And we're, this construction is going to bump all that factor safety of that area up to above 1.5. In fact, 1.68, I think, is what we're uh, showing on our stability calculations. How many feet is the, uh, on back on, how many nope. feet is that line of shear pins to the right from the back of that house? This distance? Up, up in the right-hand corner, the upper right-hand corner. This? That to the, la to the right to that house. Oh, to this house. Yeah, how many feet is that? Got a number on that? <laughs> Here or take. Okay, thank you. Bye. And this is just a cross section taken through that, through this uh, drawing right there that shows the shear pins, the tiebacks, and there's a there's a weak zone down in the ground uh, that we saw in our large diameter holes that all these are going to be passing through and being tied back below so that all of this area in green here is going to now be protected with a much higher factor of safety, and that includes the Mesa trunk sewer line. It also has a benefit downslope, because all of these things that are, now, that are you know, within the, ancient, the old landslide are uh, reducing the driving force that, of that weight of that landslide that it was pushing on the lower portions, plus... We're taking away all of the water from this area and all the way going up to the driveway to, the, to El Camino de la Luz. All that water is being contained in three different storage tanks on site, and it won't be going into the ground. We're also putting in horizontal drains between these shear pins that are going to take away the subsurface water. So this whole area downslope is now being improved in terms of stability as well. That's just a cross-section through it showing the uh, landslide debris that's in place that will now have an uh, improvement in slope stability. 
Now, I, I know Mark Johnson didn't provide any examples of consistency, but I, I, so I wanted to provide one and just go through that with you a little bit because it has so many compelling similarities to this case. There's only one similarity that's not, com not the same, and that is this was for a golf course and not a single-family residence. But, you know, you're not supposed to allow golf courses uh, in the, on the bluff face. Uh, this, this example has the same geologic formation as uh, the project we're working on here, Monterey Formation Bedrock, the same dips, dip slope geologic condition, the layers of bedrock dip toward the ocean, uh, the same old landslide geology, except Ocean Trails does have a step-like head scarp feature, and 1925 does not. It has the same issue of a catastrophic land, landslide failure that pushed the coastal bluff face out into the ocean, and it quickly eroded back to its pre-failure condition. That happened here in 1978. At Ocean Trails, it happened in 1999. It has the same issue of a partial repair proposed with replacement of what was developed there before. So um, there was a golf course developed there. It failed. They allowed them to replace it. The same method of shear pins was utilized in the partial repair plan for that project. Uh, they didn't have the tiebacks, but they had shear pins and, and grading. Uh, the same issue with the sewer trunk line. There was a sewer trunk line there right at the top of the development that failed, and so they had to protect that with their repair. Uh, this is a, a cross-section taken through that. I apologize, it's facing the other direction. The consultant for the uh, developer put it that way. I was working for the city of Rancho Palos Verdes at the time. Uh, but this was landslide C. That was uh, well known that it was a landslide. They allowed development of the uh, golf course in this area right here, the 18th fairway. Uh, this is the top of the coastal bluff. Uh, this is landslide modified topography. Uh, and this is modified by marine erosion, the, the bluff face. And it has a dip slope condition where the bedrock is dipping toward the ocean, which is right here. And it, it, in 1999, in June, it failed um, one week before the golf course was supposed to open. Took out the 18th fairway. This is the failure right here. Goes down to the ocean. And it moved the bluff face out. And they were allowed to rebuild it. And this is how it looks today. Uh, 18th fairway. You can see the coastal bluff eroded back to where it was. Now I'd like to talk about the uh, concerns some of the neighbors have with stability uh, during construction. Uh, one of those is vibrations. What's that going to do? Uh, I am also a registered geophysicist in California as well as a, a registered geotechnical engineer. And so much of my work in the past has had to do with vibration impacts. Uh, we have our own seismometers that we uh, have in-house that we use on numerous occasions to monitor construction activities, make sure vibrations don't get out of hand. And we, would, we are proposing to use those on this project. Uh, we would use a, a combination of two seismographs that are spaced at different intervals toward developed areas to make sure that there's not a problem with vibrations. Uh, I might also add, well, let's, let's go a little further and then I'll add it in. While we do not anticipate any adverse impact on neighboring properties with respect to vibrations, we're going to monitor for them so we'll know if there's any kind of levels that would have any possibility of causing any impacts. Also, the size of equipment to construct the shear pins will be similar to the size of equipment we used to drill their exploratory borings, and, and also previous investigators used the same kind of equipment to drill holes out there as well. And we drilled much bigger holes at Ocean Trails. Let me tell you, those were 48 inches in diameter. They went down about 150 feet, and we put filled them with concrete and steel, uh, and none of that had any impact on slope stability other than improving it, uh, but it didn't do anything during construction because the construction, of course, was done during the dry time of year, which is what we propose here at this site. We, so consequently, we don't anticipate any uh, adverse impact on slope stability, but in this case, we have instruments already in the ground that we've been monitoring since 2011 that show this landslide has not moved anywhere since 2011, uh, and we're going to continue to monitor those during construction to make sure there's no additional movement during the work that's uh, conducted on this property. So um, once the construction of the lower shear pins is in place, then everything's going to be much better in terms of stability for everything on that site uh, than it was before the construction started. So I think this 
this construction is needed. If, if it isn't done by the applicant, then somebody else should be doing it to protect that sewer trunk line and the other properties that are upslope of this property in the future. My conclusions are that there's no rounded bluff top. Uh, it's pretty obvious from the topography that it's not there. Uh, I don't understand how it gets put there. And uh, there's no step-like feature either. There's a little blip on the, uh, on the cross-section. There's a couple blips, actually, one in the middle, too, that you could probably call a bluff if you wanted to use that as an example. Uh, but it doesn't meet the Coastal Commission criteria for, the, for that kind of step. Uh, the present and past coastal bluff edge is at elevation 48 to 52 feet, where it's been since 1928, at least, since we have aerial photographs going back that far. The project neither creates nor contributes to erosion, geologic instability, or destruction of the site and surrounding area. It does not require construction of any protective devices that would alter the natural landforms along bluffs or cliffs. And it significantly improves the slope stability to both the city facilities, which include the Mesa Trunk sewer line, and the private properties upslope and to the sides, as well as it increases the slope stability downslope. So I recommend that you guys approve this project. Thank you. Commissioner Peugeot has a question for you, sir. He could. You want me to stay? Yeah, okay. I have a question. Yeah. Thank you. Could you go back to the golf course sure. slides? I guess there are two of them, but. So the questions I have, just as I understand, that's a good one, I guess. Um, this was an already approved project, and it was just towards the end of completion of the golf course, is that right? Yes, well, there was, yes, it was kind of both. There was a approved project where there was a, the coastal bluff was determined to be in here, and so they approved the uh, fairway up in this area. And then it failed, and then they approved the reconstruction of the golf course. And do you know anything about the permit process for that project and when that repair let's say was done was that a repair of an existing permit I mean it's a little different isn't it because it wasn't a vacant lot when you installed those shear pins it was a repair of something that was already I guess vested and just about done but then there was sort of this emergency need to complete it or something like that i i, I don't know yeah. I, I just I, that's an example but if you could give me some information uh, I, I get your point and and the, in this case they approved it with the coastal bluff being here with an old landslide already there everybody knew there was a slide this this cross-section was done before it was approved and so they they knew there was a landslide uh they obviously didn't think it was going to fail that quickly but but it did so they had a, a sewer trunk line here. They had the area of the, the golf course right here, and they had the top of the coastal bluff edge here. They did not make the determination that somehow this is rounded away uh, up into here. They didn't make a determination that there was a step-like feature right, right here. Right, but I guess what I'm asking is more the permit processing. Was it done under an emergency permit? Or, I mean, how... I, I think there's a missing piece to that example that I guess I'm curious about how that part went. And then I had just one other question, sure. and you, I'm sure you can answer that pretty quickly, because I can kind of guess maybe the reason, but I'm not sure. Um, you said it had the shear pins, but not the tiebacks. Correct. Isn't that right? Correct. And the difference correct. was what? Why no tiebacks in this case? They, they put shear pins in down here, um, and they, they did a grading repair right here to get their fairway back up on top of a, a reinforced earth fill. And so. it was because it wasn't supporting... Right, because the slide, took, the slide took off. and Well, it could have been a structure, but it was the fairway instead that they supported. But they, they took out the entire landslide right here. But it wasn't needed. For some reason, the tiebacks weren't needed. Right. I mean, they could have done them, but they decided to do this other grading. They decided to go deep with the grading and take out it, okay. do a lot of grading. I mean, about $20 million worth of grading. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, if I can, uh, we're probably going to have a lot of questions today, so what I might do is go to public comment. We don't have that many speakers. With, if I can do that, uh, with you okay, my fellow commissioners, we'll start with Scott Wiscombe, and he's going to have four minutes. Leslie Wiscombe yielded her time. Leslie is still here. Is that correct? Okay.
Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioners. My name is Scott Wiscombe. My wife and I live on the mountainside of El Camino de la Luz. I understand that the Coastal Commission interprets Section 30010 to mean that you cannot deny all economic use of a property provided the developer had a reasonable expectation of realizing an economic use of the property. However, since the subject property is in a fragile coastal environment that demands minimum impact and has experienced a massive landslide, and the city still considers it to be a special area of concern, and bluff-based development is still and always has been prohibited by both the Coastal Commission and the LCP, we would argue that the applicant had no reasonable basis for expecting he'd be able to build on the property. But he bought it anyway. Why should the city now be forced to grant this permit to ensure the applicant receives some economic use of the property that he had no reasonable basis for expecting in the first place? What about the idea of caveat emptor, let the buyer beware? Staff has recommended you issue a CDP to avoid what they, learn, they term a potential taking. Granting a permit on this slide-prone coastal bluff property under these circumstances sets a very dangerous precedent. We rely on the Planning Commission to approve projects because they're worthy, they're compliant, and they won't create safety hazards, not because of potential lawsuits. We strongly recommend that you deny this CDP. If, however, you decide you cannot deny this, the CDP, you can still provide reasonable economic use of the property by reducing the projects to a size that's more consistent with the existing homes, uh, blufftop homes on El Camino de la Luz, while also minimizing the project's impact on coastal resources, which is required when granting a permit in a sensitive or prohibited coastal area. The table that's on the up there now shows um, all eight existing bluff top homes on uh, El Camino de la Luz and, and their lot sizes. We believe this is a more appropriate benchmark for deciding on an amount of economic use to be granted rather than the 20 closest homes. El Camino de la Luz is a unique neighborhood with a very different character than Edgewater Way, for example, where there's one 6,000 plus square foot house that, that skews the average size of the 20 homes and provides a basis for justifying this large home and a lap pool and a patio on our sensitive coastal bluff. The list also excludes most of the rest of the 20 closest homes because they're not built on the bluff. We believe that these eight homes represent the existing bluff top neighborhood character with which the project should be compatible. These eight homes range, as you can see, in size from just over 1,300 square feet to about 1,900 square feet, an average 1,624. At 2,800 square feet, the proposed house is more than 70% larger than the average of these eight homes and 50% larger than the largest of the eight. As well, at a 20,000 square foot lot, the project's lot is 12% smaller than the average lot size for these eight homes. So bigger house on a smaller lot. You should know that two of these eight homes sold for an, a, approximately $3.5 million within the last 18 months. So we believe that a smaller development that's compatible in character and scale to the existing bluff top homes can still provide a reasonable economic use of the property while importantly minimizing the project's impact on sensitive coastal resources. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Next speaker will be Nancy Brock, and Nancy will be followed by Tom Morrison. He's giving me his time. I'm sorry? Tom is giving me his time. He's not speaking. Okay. Uh, so you will have a total of four minutes. Tom is, still, Tom is here? Yes. Okay, thank you. Let me just set that up for four minutes. Chair Campanella and commissioners, we've met before. <laughs> I'm the contiguous property owner to Mr. Felke's two bluff top lots. You're being asked to make an exception, an exception to established and long-standing 
protective regulations of the Coastal Act. Construction is not permitted on the Ocean Bluff face. The single exception asked for would set a precedent, a precedent that could be compounded by request for building permits on the 11 or more possible bluff face lots in our El Camino de la Luz area alone. That's an unsustainable prospect. This same fragile ocean bluff has been threatened before. As you've heard time and again, 1978, there was a catastrophic landslide. In 1969, it was a wash in oil from an offshore spill. The phoenix that arose from that goo was the passion and the commitment of Santa Barbarans. Let's remember our history. Those Santa Barbarans work to protect our beautiful area, to create the California Coastal Commission, and to open a prototype environmental studies program at the university. Santa Barbara was the bright star in the environmental world. So what will you say to those pioneering environmentalists that are friends and citizens? What will you say to the futurists the PD candidates at UCSB's Bren School. What will you say to your neighbors and children? Will you say that the city was willing to sell its exemplary environmental legacy to satisfy the monetary desires of a developer? I hope not. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll have Grace Peterson will be followed by Bruce Peterson. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Grace Peterson, and I have lived on El Camino de la Luz 14 years. I would like to read a section which is on March 2nd, 2016 letter from the Ventura District, California Coastal Commission Office to the city of Santa Barbara. I quote, this determination of the bluff top to be at 127 feet elevation, however, means that the buildable portion of the subject parcel would be located directly on the bluff face. As stated above, policy 8.2 of the LCP specifically prohibits development on a bluff face with only a few narrow exceptions that do not include residential development. Additionally, development on the bluff face would directly conflict with sections 30250 and 30253 of the Coastal Act, as incorporated into the city's LCP, as it would have a significant impact on visual and geologic coastal resources and contribute to the geologic instability and the potential destruction of the proposed development. Thus, the project would be inconsistent with the policies and provisions of the city certified LCP. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you, Ms. Peterson. Uh, Bruce Peterson will be followed by Robert uh, Stenson, who would be our last speaker. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, how, did we get, how did we get here? Well, Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo set foot in San Diego Bay back in 15... 42. We fast forward 430 years ahead to November 7th, 1972. Proposition 20, Peter Douglas and his group got with a tremendous opposition, $100 spent for every dollar he spent, and we passed the Proposition 20, which led to the California Coastal Act. Santa Barbara in 1981 passed its first one revised in 1994 and the last one in November of 2004. The, the uh, applicants uh, bought the land in 2005 with full knowledge that there was little development potential. I can't feel sorry for them. I've built over 80 homes in Santa Barbara County as an investor and developer. I've made money on some, lost money on some. Uh, it's the nature of the game. In this case, I don't think we can 
go against uh, LCP policies by granting a CDP at this point in time. Uh, good luck, and when the rules change, get a building permit. Thank you. Thank you. That was our last speaker. Oh, one more. I'm sorry. Sorry. Pardon me. Two more. Robert Stenson and then Janice Taylor will be our last speaker. Yes, my name is Robert Stenson, and time is short, so I'll talk quick. Uh, single Family Development uh, Board uh, used house size, uh, house size for site for uh, comparison between uh, the various homes to decide whether it was in line with neighborhood construction. What it didn't use was siting requirements. Uh, all homes along the Edgewater El Camino line. Uh, extend along an east-west line. None of them protrude southward toward the ocean except for the uh, project under consideration which sticks out and is very obvious. Uh, it is not consistent with neighborhood um, um, uh, design criteria. Now a word about regulatory taking and uh, I see a naive buyer coming in and purchasing a parcel of land he faces regulations that are newly minted. A second case is a knowledgeable buyer that purchases a parcel of land that has proscri proscriptions on it of some sort at the time of purchase. After years of banging on the doors of various commissions, the owner of the property decides that the inability to develop the land constitutes a regulatory taking. The buyer was knowledgeable at the time of purchase. The regulations were in place at the time of purchase, but economic development is now stunted and the buyer claims a taking. If regulatory taking the threat of it, as is in the case I just described, is considered a viable excuse for permitting the land's development, can of worms is open. The expansive interpretation of regulatory taking will have opened up. Reinterpretation of regulation, regulations which are applicable in multiple venues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then our last speaker is Janice Taylor. Hi there, I'm Janice Taylor. I live on the mountainside of the same street. Uh, I just wanted to bring up a, a couple of points. Um, frankly, I think it's absolutely crazy to be considering granting a permit on what's really propped up de debris-filled uh, land. Um, the, pres the precedent is frightening, uh, particularly in light of the shrinking of the bluff top, just with, with uh, the way our environment and ecology is going. And also, um, of course, we're coming out of a long drought, and everybody knows the fear of all the rains that come after drought and what that does to, uh, to uh, landslides. I mean, you think about La Conchita and all those places. I mean, the, the measurements that I heard earlier, that was all being done during a drought. Of course, it's, uh, there wasn't change yet, but, but what's to come is very frightening. Um, I, I've spent, I've lived on the property for 26 years. I've spent a lot of time with the residents who lived there when the, uh, when the devastating landslide happening happened. And frankly, they were frightened. Uh, whenever there was a rainstorm, um, having lived uh, during that week when they kept hearing the cracks and the, and the landslide was coming, it was, it was devastating. And so I just feel very compelled to share that with you. Um, it's, a, it's a dangerous area. Um, we really have to be concerned for, for my neighbors who live in that uh, surrounding area. And um, let's see what other notes I had. Uh, uh, I, I also did want to mention that it's, it just seems like uh, all the wrong, um, I mean, there's some kind of pressures going on that uh, things are being, being kind of pushed through quickly. I, there weren't even story polls um, asked for for, the, for this project, so it's not even... Um, if we were to, to uh, be considering proceeding with some kind of um, review process, those kind of things haven't even been considered yet. But um, I don't even think you should be getting to that point. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. N any other speaker slips? Or Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Steve Coffin for the applicant. And very briefly, uh, I think you should avoid getting into the takings issue. And I've argued that to you. We've asked you to uh, direct staff to delete references in the conditions to the bluff edge and policy 8-2 regarding project inconsistency because it's not supported by the evidence. We asked you also to delete condition 1D.1.D 1 .1 .D 
regarding the uh, construction-related uh, truck trip times. We have no problem with the four MND measures that Kathy mentioned on slide 20, so you can add those. Uh, and we thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, it's now time for questions from the commission. Anyone like to start? Let's see, I think Mr. Uh, Commissioner Thompson was first. I have a question for uh, Mr. Vincent. Uh, the term natural landform, is that defined in the Coastal Act anywhere? I looked for it and couldn't find it. Uh, to give an example, obviously if someone uh, puts a bulldozer on a property and scrapes in a uh, uh, step into the hillside, that's not a natural landform. But is a landslide not natural? Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, to answer your question, I just looked in the definition section of the Coastal Act. There is not a specific definition of natural. No, I looked and I couldn't find yeah. one. Uh, the, I think that the, the example, uh, I don't, without a definition, I, do, I couldn't answer whether, it, obviously, a, land, a landslide without uh, regrading, I think that would be a natural, a natural landform. Uh, the bluff face, as uh, Mr. Kaufman you know, mentioned a couple times in his, his uh, testimony today, that there are erosional processes occurring on the bluff face all the time. That's how the bluff face gets its shape. So an, a landslide that is, doesn't have uh, human intervention following the landslide, I would suggest that's a natural landform. A landslide that has human intervention and regrading after the landslide, I would don't see that being a natural landform. Yeah, if it occurred to me that if that were not the case, then we would always have to be trying to go back to the prehistoric landform to determine where things were, like bluff tops and so forth, which would be an impossible task to do. Okay, thank you. Okay, Commissioner, uh, uh, who's Jordan? I think. I'm sorry, get right back to you. Uh, Commissioner Lodge, you next. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, why don't, why don't I go ahead? Since go I ahead. had essentially I had the same question okay. that Commissioner Thank Thompson you. had. I uh, the one other project, coastal project that I was involved with in the past was about building a rock revetment to prevent bluff retreat for a property. A significant, clearly bluff, no slope already, but the waves were eating away at the base and the land was falling down. Well, Coastal Commission policy at the time and city policy at the time was, and I'm, I don't know if it's not any longer, that <clears throat> not to permit these kinds of things because bluff retreat is a natural process. Now, is that uh, Mr. Shires, perhaps you, or uh, the attorney? I think fairly stated that the commission still believes that bluff retreat is the, is the natural process. The problem here is that this wasn't a landslide that was natural. It didn't just fall away. There was some city water and some other issues associated with that, and we've tried to resist staying away from any issues with the city. We don't want to talk about takings or any of that. We just want a permit. But the specific answer to your question is, uh, in, in different communities, when I'm on the other side and I represent a city, uh, bluff retreat is something that, uh, or managed retreat is something that uh, the commission will plan for. And unless it's to protect an existing house, uh, the seawall is not uh, necessarily permitted <coughs> under, under okay. the coastline. line. Okay. Well, then I, do, I don't understand then. Bluff retreat happens through landslides. Well, so why isn't a landslide then a natural form? This, form? this type of landslide doesn't happen through bluff retreat. This is a translational landslide. So if you remove material at the toe, it really doesn't affect the stability of the landslide. It's more impacted by whatever it's failing on top of and whether or not you have a large amount of water coming into that picture from up above. It's, it's not the type of land. We have, what we have, we have rotational landslides. Those can be affected by eating away at the toe. Yes, there are types of landslides that can be. Or you have a translational landslide which fails on a plane where eating away at the toe really doesn't change the dynamics of that landslide much. It's mostly the weight of the material itself and the 
uh, strength of the plane that it's failing on and any water that's added into the picture from up above. So this is a different situation than if you had a rotational slide. But we do look at erosion of the cliff face. I mean, that is definitely part of the process. We have to uh, carefully go back through the records of all the aerial photographs, determine, you know, as far back in time as we can, in this case we have 1928 to go from, and determine how much is that sea cliff eroding back. But that's marine erosion. It's the waves cutting at the toe of the slope, and it's, it's working its way back because it's getting eroded by the ocean and by rainfall directly onto the cliff face. So that's a different issue. That's not a land, big landslide coming in from far away. That's happening right at the bluff face. And so we have to look at that, and we have to calculate how much will that go back each year, and we have to site the house that much further back so that it's not impacted by that, that erosion. And that's what we've done here. We've put it far enough back so that none of that comes into play. And none of the rotational failures that would occur on the bluff face come into play. We also analyze the stability for those. No, at the last, the last hearing, um, you showed a slide of a, of a landslide in the 1920s. I don't remember the year. Um, 28, 29. Yeah. 28, 28, 29. <clears throat> Now, presumably, that didn't have, um, you know, m run off from city streets at that time, or did it? Or how, how does that compare to the 1978 we landslide, and, and, was, yeah. and was what resulted a natural landform or not? Well, there's a dip-slope condition here. So you have the bed, bedrock that's adversely sloping toward the ocean, and you have a lot of rainfall. There was a big, a huge rain year in the 20s, I think in 26 or something, which might have triggered that, what we see on the 28 photographs. But there also were roads in the area. I don't know. We haven't studied to see if they had an impact on that or not. But uh, certainly the rainfall did. And, but but that's, a different, that's a different issue. The, the type of landslide that we're talking about there it goes way back. And in some of these uh, cases, you can even see scarps maybe along this coast going back further, too, above development, which may be past movement of these beds dipping toward the ocean. But it's not a function of the marine erosion of the cliff face. It's not a function of the bluff face. It's a function of deep, prob you know, deep geology that's working back from the coast. Combined with wave action. Uh, no, not necessarily. Not, not these dip slope ones. The wave action really doesn't have a big impact on those because they're translational. It, if you have the same thickness of material and you cut away a little slice of it at the toe, it doesn't really impact the stability of that big thickness of material very much. If it was, if it was a curved failure surface and you took away the toe, then you're taking away the resisting part of that landslide. I know it's a difficult concept, but it's it's much more uh, problematic at the, when you take away the toe from a, a curved failure, which is a circular failure, we call them in the business, versus a translational failure, which is sort of along a plane, which dips uniformly toward the ocean. Okay, and that's what we had in 78. This, they, this, the 78, we had, a, we had a pre existing landslide, we had a lot of rainfall. We had streets, I, I think maybe something got blocked in one of the streets so that the drains came down off the streets and went down the driveway for 1925 and 1921 and flooded those properties with a lot of water in a short amount of time. And, that, and that's what triggered that 1978 landslide. Okay, and then um, just refresh my memory. You had the caissons going down and the tiebacks and the shear pins and all our... Is that all part going into this? I assume it has to be going into the same Monterey formation. Yes, it, except it goes, what, what we did is we drilled large diameter holes and we went down inside those and we looked at the Monterey formation, every single layer going down uh, 50 feet or 60 feet in the ground. And we, uh, we found that there was one bed that was very suspect, very weak. And so uh, that's what we based our analyses on. But below that, the beds were very strong. And so all the way down, and so then eventually you get down deep enough where if you find a weak bed, it has nowhere to tow up at because the level of the uh, um, beach is higher than that, so it's buttressed. So, uh, but we do look for those kind of things, and we did find one in this case, and that's what the shear pins go through that, and the tiebacks go through that so that we're stabilizing everything above that weak bed. And that weak bed, is, if you extend it further toward the ocean, it's probably what it failed on in 1978. 
or something similar to that. And then we've also had to do wave run-up studies. Uh, we have a, a consultant that was uh, hired for this project to do a very comprehensive study of all the sea level rise, wave run-up, uh, and what that might do to the, to the uh, bluff edge. And we've taken that into account in all of our analyses in terms of how far we're set back from whatever influence that might have. And it doesn't impact where the house has been sited right now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will always defer to Commissioner Lodge, okay? <laughs> Um, Mr. Shires, it's Shires, right? Yes. Yeah, you're warmed up. Come on back up here. Um, can I have staff uh, find one of those, uh, or I think we're referring them to the Johnson slide that shows the two yellow line markers? Or, and in the meantime, so uh, part of your talk on um, potentially making sure during the installation of these um, caissons and tiebacks is that you'll have these little vibration monitors. Yes. And the phrase you actually used is, we'll watch that it doesn't get out of hand. Uh, can you explain to me what out of hand looks like? Yes. How would you know when it's out of hand? And then what are you going to do if you're doing what you need to do to build the project, but it's getting out of hand? Uh, there, there are things you can do. You can, you can uh, shut equipment down, get a different kind of equipment in to do, do the drilling. There's different various drill rigs that you can use. What we do is we, there's, a, there's a huge record out there of, of what causes damage from what types of equipment and how big of vibrations, and it's always... It's ex expressed in terms of peak particle velocity. But part of part of uh, your team's application too, it, or or discussion, is also that this is that every site is unique. Every yes. site has different components. Every site is very unique. So so I guess what I'm really looking at, it rather than a kind of a, a manual on what to use, is how how do you know what works on this site if it's unique, and then at what point is what number of a vibration out of hand, and then when it is out of hand, what's the, what's the consequence? Yes, we, we have, uh, like I said, there's been a lot of studies where we know what kind of peak particle velocities can cause damage to buildings or to, any, to other kinds of structures, even architecturally ancient things. They have certain standards of a peak particle velocity that's acceptable, that it won't cause a, uh, a crypt or something that was built next to a BART train, which I've done a study on, <laughs> uh, to, to come apart. And so you have all these standards and you have these instruments that, very, that have uh, geophones that you plug into the ground and you plug into the instrument and they monitor the, the earth for those kind of vibrations and you set a threshold on the instrument of, say, 0.2 feet per second. Okay. Uh, and, and that instrument then will, will wait and you'll do your vibration activity over here and if you get a, a peak uh, particle velocity that exceeds that threshold, the instrument lights up and starts recording, and you can see what kind of vibrations you're getting in excess of that threshold. And we all, and then we know exactly what kinds of thresholds create damage to structures. And what do you do? When and so what we, we do is we, we do you pull back on the amount of feet it's going? Well, we, yeah, we take we take two instruments and we spread them apart. We do one closer to the activity, one further away, and we see how it attenuates. And if, you know, because as far the way as okay. you get from a vibration, the right. less it gets. So okay. we, we actually are able to calculate that, and then we can put it next to the structure that we're worried about and okay. say, okay, it's not a problem over there. It is where we're monitoring, but it's it is, not. But it is a problem over there. Then what do you do? Then you, then you have to shut down your, whatever you're doing because you're liable to cause some sort of vibration damage. You have to change your methodology. And what? In this particular situation, what would a change of methodology? You might look like? use a different type of drill rig. Like an, there's various types of augers, bucket augers, uh, flight augers, uh, all kinds of different things that I you mean, can. So it's kind of air hammers. Reading between the lines, there you start with the one you think will work that's least expensive, and Ex the one that does better <laughs> is going to cost more, right? Well, the one that's used the most. I don't know if they're necessarily. Yeah, they probably are the least expensive okay. that they're used the most. Okay, and then on this slide, so you said a couple things. One, you said. <laughs> You were talking about this space between here and there not being a constant incline. And I'm assuming you mean because it's got this little dimple right there, right? Because no. when I look at this, it's pretty much a constant incline. No, it's not. That's not what, the, what I was trying to say. If I said that, I apologize. What, what has to happen is... They're not going to let you stand over there. Is that your point? Yep. Oh, I've got it somewhere. Hang on. Oh, here it you're is. Gonna, you're going to get all kinds of trouble from this young lady. I, I know. I, I, I've, I've been in trouble before. Uh, what, what has to happen for a rounded bluff top is this has to increase consistently until it gets to that point. So it, it, the steepness has to be 
steeper right here than it does right here. It has to keep getting steeper and steeper and steeper until it gets to that point. Okay, but... I it's agree. not. It's this is flatter than this, so it's not getting steeper. Yeah, for, this is flatter what, than this for ten feet. What's that? For ten feet, and then yeah, it, yeah. then then it is steeper again, right? And then it kind of lays off. It lays little. off again. So yeah. what 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 the what we are saying? It really has to be a direct line. You can't have these little. You can't have all these these leveling out things. It's got to be okay. continually right. rolling down into that. Uh, steep, I wouldn't characterize that. them as leveling out, but I get your point. Yeah. They're well, still. yeah, you're right. <laughs> and then if this guy right here where you're uh, maintaining is the the bluff edge if that was just to k just to schluff off mm -hmm. and now you had a line starting there and running uphill to there would staff's bluff edge be more accurate then no because what happens is when it, after it caves off then the wave action steepens it back up to this angle so, it, so a different angle would, a similar angle would form like that in a different location. Yes. Probably. Yes. So it wouldn't, you wouldn't just see a slicing of that. No, it doesn't. Whatever, just, whatever I'm calling that little point where your arrow is, which seems to be the whole uh, argument for where the bluff face is, right? Exactly. It, it doesn't just keep laying itself back. Okay. It, it just keeps being at this steep angle because that's what the materials will support. Sure, I have something else for you here, if you'll give me a second. Um, can you talk to me about how the caissons are installed? Are they, are they hammered or are they drilled? No, there's no hammering at all. They're, they're, they're totally, they drill a hole, and then they set the steel in it, and then they pour concrete in it. Okay, so there's nothing. So, so, so the, the issue on the worry of vibrations is more something's in the ground and it's wiggling rather than something's being pounded into the ground. Yes. Is that good for my lay brain? That's correct. And, and if you pound something, you have a much bigger chance of heavy vibrations. Well, you can hear it all over town when they're doing it somewhere. Yeah, pile correct. driving is way, okay. way more uh, vibration. Uh, create, it creates way more vibrations than drilling. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Vincent, a um, couple for you. So, um, you know, against uh, what I would consider real comments, a couple uh, letter writers referred to past uh, enforcement or ordinance-related issues with this owner. Um, not that I really uh, appreciate that, but could you just, um, uh, do you know if there are any open ordinance-related or enforcement actions with this owner? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, I'm not aware of any open cases, but uh, the community development staff may may be more familiar with the records than me. The references I saw were pretty old, so we we did not check that information. Okay. That's good. And then, um, Mr. Vincent, so so I'm confused on when does a legal parcel not become so. When does a legal buildable parcel not become so? So staff's taking the position in this particular case that it's that it is a legal buildable parcel, despite the fact that it's moved down towards the water in in what staff is arguing past the bluff edge. If it was closer to the water, is that still the case? Does it have to be a vacant piece of parcel? Um, can you kind of help me with that? I mean, when does it actually never become buildable? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, the, I, I, the term buildable is, isn't, I wouldn't suggest that is the, the appropriate metric in this case. The, the parcel is, is a legal parcel. It was, to my knowledge, uh, subdivided in compliance with the Subdivision Map Act or was subdivided in a manner that did not comply or didn't have to comply with the Subdivision Map Act at the time. Uh, the, the, the lot is technically buildable. The question for this commission is whether or not the proposal before the commission is consistent with the applicable policies. That's, that determination is, starts and it starts or the, the determination or the conclusion of this commission, the finding that you will need to make in order to approve a development or or would be giving you grounds for denying the development, is whether or not the proposal before you is consistent with the applicable policies. 
the, the particular 8.2, uh, policy 8.2 is the one that's it's the elephant in the room. And the elephant is standing on where is this bluff edge determination. This commission needs to make that determination. You have in the record before you, you have essentially two sets of evidence. You have the evidence that's been marshaled in the staff report and provided largely from the Coastal Commission geologist. And you have evidence that has been presented and marshaled by the applicant. Ultimately, the commission needs to make a determination of which set of evidence is more convincing as to the, determin as to the location of the bluff edge. Once you make that determination, the course of your decision is, is kind of set. At, le at least it is, that is a key fork in the road. You make your determination of where the bluff edge is. If you make the determination as the applicant has suggested in, in their materials, the proposal is not on the bluff face. And, they, and I would submit that the proposal is there, therefore, because it's, it, the staff report has shown that it's consistent with all other applicable Coastal Act policies, including the cities as well as the, the Coastal Commission, the Coastal Act itself, I would submit that if the bluff edge is at the 48 to 52 foot location, the project is consistent with the Coastal Act. If you make the determination that it's at 127, the staff report lays out a process where the commission can still consider the approval of the project through the alternative means found in Public Resources Code Section 30,010. And that is the, in an, the approval of the project, despite the inconsistency, in order to avoid a taking. Okay, and uh, so I would assume then, since staff is, staff stance is right now that it uh, the the building envelope does uh, straddle the bluff edge, but it is. It then and then staff stance is that it uh, is subject to that second uh, that Coastal Commission 3010 the the possible regulatory taking that that's a legal uh, consideration and determination that we've made that makes sense to avoid future litigation is that the right way to phrase that. And I guess what I so what I'm thinking of there is, and I'm thinking back. I don't remember where were the where was it the Conejo landslides, and we deemed them uh, unsafe. We had to defend that in court. We lost, and it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. Is there an analogy there on what took place there? I realize one's Coastal Commission and one there, there's relief in the Coastal Commission. But if we sat down and actually done you know, a risk management look at here and said and, and said that if 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 the applicant continues to want to go forward and we say this is on the bluff face that there is a a viable relief in the in the coastal act. Is that there is that where we are? Mr. Chair, I would say uh, there are lots of different questions there. I'll try to answer as many as I can. I'll try to answer them all. Uh, the comparison between this situation and Conejo that the Conejo decision uh, is illustrative in this situation because the city in that case adopted an ordinance prohibiting new construction on that landslide mass and a court disagreed with the basis on which the, the city said that we were adopting that ordinance prohibiting new construction because it, that new construction would cause an imminent threat to public safety. The court disagreed with our evidence supporting the imminent threat. The court said, we don't see that this is an imminent threat. It might happen something, but they, the courts looked at the, the evidence in that, search, in that situation and did not come to the same conclusion that the city had, that it presented an imminent threat that required that kind of ordinance in order to avoid a nuisance. So. We've, had, we've heard some discussion today uh, about the takings. It would not be a taking for the, if, it, if, there was, if this project before us 
posed an imminent threat to public safety. We could, avoid, we could take action to avoid that public nuisance, and that would not constitute a taking, even though it might take all economic use of the property if we had, if we had the ability to show that. I submit that in this particular case, like the Conejo case, we don't have evidence to show that this application would present an imminent threat to public safety, justifying a complete denial. Beyond that, then you have the other two, really there are two other ways a takings happens in this particular situation, two, two ways of takings that are applicable in this circumstance. One is the taking of all economic use or a much more amorphous process of the Penn Central test, which is determining whether or not the regulatory restrictions go too far. And the Supreme Court literally used that phrase, go too far. It doesn't give you a lot of direction. Sorry. Um, so in this particular case, I think the staff report explains and shows where if the bluff edge determination is at the 127 level, there really isn't any way of building a single family home on this lot that in a manner that is consistent with the uh, policy 8.2. The the city's rules about how you design a single family home, what a single family home looks like, how you how you would access it, uh, how you would park it in consistent, you know, consistently with the zoning. Those alternatives don't appear to to be available. So we're looking, and since this is a single family zoned lot, that's the allowable use. That's the economic use that you could have on this lot. They there isn't, a, they couldn't do something else to recoup their their investment so the um so those are and uh, those are the kind of you know okay. what uh, the the landscape as far as what a take you know what, what presents the the possibility of a taking and then it seems like uh, our new best friend for where the bluff top has been is this mark johnson guy um but have we not done any work with the Coastal Commission to validate if we think that the the top of Bluff Face is at 127, that also that Coastal Commission um, legislation of 30010 would credibly apply in this particular case? I don't know where to ask that question. So we're so so staff saying staff saying the bluff tops at 127, but staff's also saying there's relief. Staff's using a coastal commission person to determine the bluff top face. I don't see anybody, but, and then I hear the applicant saying that whole process is wrong, but I don't see any coastal commission quasi input there on saying that it's a, a natural relief to flow to that other part of the coastal commission act, coastal act. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, I, the, the section, the Coastal Act section exists. It is available for the use by either local agencies or the Coastal Commission. If this project is appealed to the Coastal Commission, they will have the opportunity to make a determination whether they need to use that, that section or not. Um, if they find a, they are, there are other cases, there are case law examples where the application of that public resources code section in order to overcome a policy inconsistency was, a, was found to be an available tool to the Coastal Commission. So I, I mean, I, I don't the know. The answer's if, no. We haven't availed ourselves of any credible input from the Coastal Commission on use of the relief part of the act. See, I guess my, my problem with that is every, every other at the, the whole process to get to there has also used the Coastal Act and our local coastal plans, which ties into the Coastal Act. And so, okay, I get that. But then we're stepping over that door sill and saying, but we're going to use this relief point. Well, the answer can't be that, well, that act is there for somebody else to worry about or apply when we availed ourselves of other information from the Coastal Commission to get to that point, why didn't we avail ourselves of whether or not it's a credible application in this particular situation to look for relief? 
I, I'm not. Enti I'm trying to understand the question. It, the col the the, the coastal act section exists. It is for this commission to one determine whether the inconsistency exists, and therefore you need to even use that section to overcome a con inconsistency. If you find that it, the inconsistency in policy exists, and you find that that inconsistency in policy re, uh, has the potential of prohibiting all economic use or going too far in the restriction of the use of this property so as to cause a taking, the city is then left with two choices. This commission doesn't have the authority to exercise one choice which is to purchase the property. That's the other half of takings analysis. If, you've, if the city could go in and use eminent domain to per, and purchase the property to avoid the taking. Alternatively, the city could, and this, this, the, this commission would start this process. If, this, if the commission chooses to utilize this section, you could approve the project which would be another way of avoiding the taking because the property owner would have an economically beneficial use of the property and the taking would not occur. I, I, I don't know why I don't understand this. So we've got all kinds of documentation leading me to the point where you're asking me to make a decision on whether the relief part of the act applies. You've got reports in a truckload. You've got a Coastal Commissioner staff member m multiple times offering his opinion to set that line at 127. The only thing you have in the, in the staff report or in documentation is a paragraph citing the relief part of the act saying that's, an way, that's a way out if you choose to do it. You have, no, you have no input from the Coastal Commission saying, well, that'll hold up or it won't hold up. Why would I? Why, why would I? Why would I? If I, if, I, if, I, if I buy into the stance of staff that, that they've done a good job and they're setting the top of bluff face at 127, what's helping me say that it's a credible next step to go to that relief section and we're not going to be blindsided that it's actually a, it's a closed door if somebody decides to appeal that? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, I, I wouldn't concern yourself with the closed door. The closed door would, you know, you know the the slide that the staff put up earlier as to what your decision points are and what would be the consequences of those decision points. If this commission chooses to utilize the uh, Public Resources Code Section 30,010, approves the project, the project could be appealed to the City Council. If the City Council denies the project, then it stops there. However, then the City has to deal with the potential consequences of a uh, inverse condemnation case. If the city council elects to follow the on appeal, elects to follow the same process, or comes to a different determination as to the bluff face and approves the project, that action can then be appealed to the Coastal Commission. And then it sits at the Coastal Commission's feet. And they choose on their own, on a de, de novo hearing, on appeal, they make their own decisions as to where the bluff edge is, where the bluff face is, and whether or not the proposed project is or is not consistent with the applicable coastal policies. And then they can make their decision on whether or not to approve or deny the project. And they live with the consequences of their action. Okay. So that's, that, there's, it's not a matter of a door shutting. The, there's, there are actions and reactions through that process. It seems like if you buy one, you have to buy the other, but we've done a lot of work on making me buy one, but then there's no answer on that the next step is credible. So um, a couple questions for staff. So I watched a little bit of the uh, last uh, single family design board, I think in May, which was this, this, I think they just had two visits there. That was the second one. And I kind of gave up onto it a little bit. So if, um, Again, if you're accepting the stance of staff that this house is, is sitting on that 127 line and that is the top of the bluff face, this, it, the single-family design board reviews houses 
but it didn't appear that they had any um, direction at that time that the house was located anywhere other than a house would normally be located on a parcel, that it wasn't going to be or potentially on a bluff face. And I, and I think also we don't have guidelines or rules for reviewing design on a bluff face because our actual local coastal plan prohibits it. So uh, is, was, there, was, there any, was there anything there that I didn't see or was there any process that uh, would help, help me feel better about that level of design um, that they went through that didn't actually get waved in front of them as this is special and potentially going to be on a bluff face? Mr. Chair, Commissioner Jordan, there was a lot of public comment, and it was um, brought to the board's attention that it was a previous site um, where there was a landslide, so they are very aware of that. Um, they did defer to a, a next um, determination. They may have mentioned Planning Commission about determining where the, pro where the home would be um, allowed to be built, but they were very aware of the fact that it was on a landslide area, but they just did review it from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, they knew that perhaps maybe wouldn't be allowed in that location for some reason in the future. Uh, also, they knew it was on a hillside in the hillside design district, so they reviewed it under that um, right. those guidelines so, as well. So you're telling me you're comfortable yep. with it, but we didn't really call it out as being something that exceeds the normal design because it's on a bluff face because we really don't have a a template for that, do we? We don't do designs on bluff faces. I wouldn't say that. I think the, the board was very aware of the location, the site-specific constraints. They said that it may be in the future that this project would not be allowed, okay. but that we would that they would look at it from under their guidelines. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, and they uh, I was just reminded that they did ask for... Um, the applicant to look at alternatives, and they did come back with with their 12 closest home study. They also did a FAR study um, to show what the FAR would be if they were to build the project um, closer to the street. So they did look at that. Okay, thanks. Yes. I just found one more question. So I really appreciate Mr. Orell's uh, um, little pictures today with the stick guys on the beach and the one up on the road. It, it draws a, a clear line. But what happens in the field when you actually start constructing and something changes in, in, you know, vertically and it changes the elevation versus what we're being shown today? So we're being, for example, we're being shown that a person can stand somewhere on El Camino de la Luz and look towards the ocean and not see any of the house. But they get out there and they have uh, soil or foundation issues and the thing has to be raised two feet, and now you can see a house. How, do, how does that get handled? Mr. Chair, Commissioner Jordan, well, they need to comply with the plans, and then what happens in projects, that, for, like you said, things happen, and we review it. Um, minor things can be uh, approved at a very low level, SCD level. Um, we have four levels, as you know. Some things are done, staff level, during plan check minor items, um, and then they elevate from there. So if, if staff determines that it's significant enough, it would come to um, Planning Commission lunch meeting to discuss, um, and then it could also be a, a regular Planning Commission hearing to determine so that change. With this example of I'm standing on El Camino de la Luz in the elevations and not seeing a house versus I'm standing on El Camino de la Luz and seeing a house, would that rise to a level of staff concern that it would come back? Absolutely. Somewhere? That is part of the project description. It is um, designed as such. We, we um, are assuming that's the case, so that would be something that would Super. definitely be Thank reviewed. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Pujo. Thank you. My First question is on 30010 as well, and um, some of it's been answered. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. I had some of those questions too. Um, but my follow up question to that, I suppose, is for Mr. Vincent, I believe. Um, has there been any other occasion in the past that you can recall where the commission? has made this kind of a determination under 30010 versus 
this kind of a determination being made at a higher level where, for example, you could discuss potential lawsuit issues, say, in a closed session or um, the cost of compensation, which we can't. I mean, we're, we're, we're only getting a, a, a piece of the authority here because along with it, we don't get to have those other discussions. So has this ever happened at Planning Commission before? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, in the 12 years I've been doing this, no, and in the 21 years almost that I've been working for the city, I've never seen the city have occasion to use this section. Uh, I, it, it doesn't happen very often. Correct. In particular because it, you, know, you really don't get to the use of this section until you have a direct conflict between a proposed project that goes so far that it prohibits nearly all or all economic use of the property. If this property had some place where you could put a 1,000, 2,000 square foot house, something that's consistent with what would be expected in this neighborhood, then you would, the, the conflict would be avoided to the point where you could avoid the taking. But what you see in this particular example, if the determination of the bluff edge is at the 127 level, the footprint of the lot is swallowed entirely, and there really isn't a place to put a single family home. Yet at the commission, in addition to those other things, we don't have any ability to make an economic determination. We don't have that information in front of us either. So it's, uh, it is a curious to me that uh, I'm not sure if we are fully equipped actually in, in that regard. Um, so my next, my next question um, has to do about some of the alternatives that were bantered about at least through the um, environmental review and the, the environmental document didn't include alternatives, but it did come up and, and there was discussion of a couple of things. And the staff report today does talk about some limited areas um, that may or may not be buildable if the structure wasn't placed on the exact site that was chosen. And, and, and I have a couple of questions there, and I think these are for staff. Um, there, are, there are two items that came up in the staff report, and I think it's on page 11, um, towards the bottom of the page. One, and, and these were, I think, discussed a little bit in the, in the environmental review hearing as well, because I recalled it back from back then. Um, the, one of them is this minimum factor for geologic stability. And I think that there were two areas identified on the parcel overall that met those minimum factors. Could you point those out to us again? Mr. Chair. Can you um, locate yes, them? I'll, I'll find the site, site plan. So there are two locations that the applicant uh, identified as being uh, stable geologically. So one area down here, the very lower, lower area, very small area down there. And then the other area that would be above the 127 uh, elevation is um, in this approximate location here. It's part of the driveway right, area. Right. So when we talked about those two alternatives that we reviewed, um, you know, the one above, uh, we talked about this that being geologically stable, but it's very small. And then down here in this area, being a little bit larger, but has the same issue of being um, unstable. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, so in that, um, in your section of the staff report, and this, like I said, was discussed at some earlier hearings, um, there, when you talk about why it may be difficult to find another place to build, there are two reasons cited. One is not meeting that minimum slope stability factor, and the other is the actual potential size of the structure in those locations. So in terms of the slope stability, 
basically, even the location that the house is proposed doesn't meet that. So obviously, there's a way to overcome that flaw. So that's not really the bottom line limiter on where else you might be able to locate something. So it seems like the main and only reason is basically the size of the house. Um, and there's some ability to put something about 740 square feet. I guess one area is uh, 105 by 12 and a half foot area, which you know sounds like it's the access or something like that. And then the other is um, a 20 by 37 foot area um, that would be above the 127 foot location. I think those are the two areas that you called out. So my question is this. If someone were by choice to propose a 740 square foot house, and I'm assuming you're meaning a one story there because that might be a footprint, correct, right? So um, if someone were to choose a 740 square foot house, would the building department find that to meet the minimum requirements for a habitable dwelling? Mr. Chair, Commissioner Pujol, so the 740 square feet is that dimension, the 20, the 20 by 37. Right. Uh, in order to meet our guidelines, they would need to provide a um, two-car garage. Right. I'm not asking that question. I'm so asking that's, about that's building. That's one constraint. But um, in theory, you could have a house that is that size, 700. As a matter of fact, feet. aren't some of the... Some units are smaller. Some yeah. units are smaller. Some of maybe even our AUD units or the grant, you know, second units may be of more or less that size. So it's a habitable size dwelling, albeit not necessarily the one someone may want. And if you have a big family, it may not fit. But it is a habitable Correct. dwelling. And, it, and, and it if it were constrained by other ordinance design criteria, some good, strong justification would be needed to do something like waive certain, like, parking requirements or whatever else it, it doesn't meet. I mean, the fact that it isn't the size they want or the size of the average house in the neighborhood is a factor, but it's still technically feasible, right? I mean, that's what I would say. So, um, so I guess I'll just throw out what will be coming one of my concerns, and that is we're asked to make this balance of the takings and to make findings, but yet we don't really have any viable proposals to show us what it would or would not end up doing for us if we... You know, we don't have a comparison of what, what are the other options because there is something out there that we just don't have in front of us. We don't have the economics. We don't have the design. We don't have a full display of alternatives. So that's, that's what I'm struggling with. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Higgins. Um, <clears throat> for staff and maybe the applicant. The um, substantial evidence that were um, <clears throat> is sort of the linchpin here, uh, certainly of the coastal uh, staff's opinion is on page 14 of the, um, I guess it's the summary of the MND. And it, and it cites, and we talked about this at the last hearing, <clears throat> prior geologic reports for the area, including the preliminary landslide investigation, Weaver, et cetera, uh, which identified the landward edge of the land scarp, landslide scarp at properties 1839, 1903, et cetera. Um, can, can you put up the, uh, that, is it the LIDAR image that shows the red and yellow colors? 
And um, can I borrow your pointer? Hmm? Can I borrow your pointer? You got a dollar? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> those seem, I guess where I'm going with this is, do we ha so where are those, pro are the studies and those properties, would have, it would have been nice to see those identified on this map so we can see that maybe we're talking about apples and apples. And, and that's the, the, the argument here is that those studies on those properties are apples to apples compared to our subject property. Mr. Chair, but I don't, oh, I'd just like to state that are you referring to the archive plans that we reviewed? Yeah, so archive we did plans, review archive other geologic plans reports, from yes. on both sides of the property, um, three or four on each side, and they all showed the top of bluff in a, um, the higher location. Well, I guess I don't really see, I, I mean, I see that, that they're not, just, just by this map, um, there's, there's definitely not apples to apples compared to what's happening here and what's happening over here. So I, without, a, without a really good synopsis or citation from those studies, it doesn't appear that, at least in the MND or the materials we've been provided, we don't have a, a really good citation of what constitutes substantial evidence as compared to the subject property so that we get apples to apples. That would be my question. Do, do you, have you given that to us? Did I miss it? Is it in the so MND? We, those we just told you that we reviewed. We didn't provide you with it, but we told you that we reviewed all the um, project plans for um, the residences that were built along here, and each of those showed a top of bluff location um, much closer, you know, in this vicinity for all these projects. So, um, but we did not actually provide that to you. But we made a conclusion based on an, a number of items. That was one of the... Uh, I, th I think I, I'm with you. I think you made some conclusions that are, I'll say, general um, and, and I don't know that they constitute substantial evidence, but um, that's, that's, my, that's where I'm struggling. Um, and I also don't know, we, we get sucked into the um, analysis or determination by coastal staff as it relates to this parcel. Has coastal staff opined on those studies as well? But that's the question I have. I don't think it's relevant for us today. Uh, that's for the Coastal Commission, isn't it? Those are my questions. Commissioner Lodge, do you have another question? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for Mr. Vincent, the, in just talking about the Conejo slides, he said the court's decision said it has to be an imminent danger. Yes, that, that, that is the... Is the, that defined... I mean, is uh, it next week? Or it's defined. Tomorrow, I mean, there, or? there are. It has. To, it has to be a, 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 a. I can't quote that particular judge's uh, application of the word "eminent," but it it means soon in time, very credible. That you're you have to be able to show a a direct correlation between the proposed development causing a. A material uh, likely, you know, a likely uh, occurrence of public hazard in a short period of time. It can't be, uh, you know, it can't be a, a long-term scenario. Uh, that that wasn't sufficient. The fact that the ordinance had been passed and that there had, over many decades, in fact, had not been a demonstrated event of the, the public health and safety hazard, that factored in significantly for, to the judge's decision. Okay, and another question. We seem to have from the Coastal Commission, Coastal, Coastal Act section, saying that, well, if there's no, you can make the findings if there's any way, even if it's on against some other coastal policy, to approve it if there's going to be, would result in a taking otherwise. Is that... So. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, the, 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 coastal, the coastal commission itself has used section 30,010 to overcome a policy inconsistency, allow it to grant a coastal development permit 
so that in order to avoid a taking. That's how they, the Coastal Commission itself describes and uses that's, that Coastal Act section. Because, and they, they explain it that, like the Planning Commission, the Coastal Commission itself doesn't have the purse, purse strings. They don't get to make decisions on whether or not to acquire real property in order to avoid a taking. And so that's how they get to the application of 30,010. They say the legislature, when adopting the Coastal Act, had this, had this language that says that it's their intent and their you know, declared intention that the Coastal Act not be applied in such a way that it causes a taking without compensation. And since the Coastal Commission doesn't have the ability to make that compensation choice, the Coastal Commission, in order to move forward and, and give effect to the, legislation, the legislature's intention stated in that section, they make this balancing and they find that if, the, if it's necessary in order to avoid a taking, they can overcome or essentially... Um, I don't want to say ignore, because none of us are ignoring the policy question here, but it, it would be overcome the policy inconsistency and allow the, a project to be approved in order to avoid the taking. Now, for the city itself, in a similar situation, would it, it, does the city have an obligation to protect someone's investment? What, what if there's somewhere else in the city but, say, a virtually vertical lot and somebody bought and they want to build on it? Is the, city, is the city under any obligation to say they can? If the city frustrates reasonable investment-backed expectations of a property owner and either goes too far in its application of regulation or in its application of regulation prohibits all economic use of the property without compensating the property owner, that is a taking, and could be, a, a case could be brought against the city. Okay, as in the Caneo Road cases. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, question for the applicant. Uh, there's obviously two different opinions uh, on the definition of bluff did you take it any further by talking to other people at Coastal Commission to see if there is some other interpretation that somebody would have or the, is, uh, the reliance so far has just been on the report that we see in front of us by Mr. Johnson? It's the latter, and <clears throat> he would be the one who would be responsible for providing the contact with your staff. So really, at this point, if we try to reach out to him, I don't know that it would change. It would have to be through staff. Yeah. Okay, at this point. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, I guess uh, the references that Mr. Johnson uses uh, to get to his conclusion, um, uh, one is the the rounding away which you've, you disagree with. Uh, the other one is the uh, step-like feature. And I guess I, got, I have a question for staff, uh, whether you've been across this before, Ms. Shelton. But it talks about a step-like feature at the top of the cliff face and landward edge at the topmost riser. This is a word we haven't seen in any of the displays, I don't think. It's, there's a word riser that's used in there. Top most risers shall be taken to the cliff edge. And where it came to mind for me was looking at the Norberg case where someone had actually done, if you will, terraces with retaining walls, which seems logical that if you're digging into the side of a cliff face, that where is the cliff face located, you would, the bluff face, you would go to the top of where you started tearing things out. But I didn't know if a riser had any influence on how we look at something, it, to me, which is vertical. Uh, and is you being used in part to determine where the bluff edge is here by saying there's a step. But 
I don't know how many vertical measurements you have to take to really substantiate that this is a test process. Or am I reading too much in the word riser? In other words, it could be gradual, or does it have to be pronounced, as in the case of a riser? Um, Mr. Chair uh, and Commission, the, um, there does need to be, a, as a part of the whole bl bluff, a, um, a steep portion. But um, we have shown that, that you know, with the, the lower part, that there, there is that 50-foot vertical portion. But the entirety of the bluff, what we're looking at is that, that, that it does have a step-like feature with an upper riser or tier or step. <laughs> there are several different words that we're, we're, that we're using. Okay, so, so again, so the, the mere fact that there's, on a plane, it's going up vertically, but on a grade of some site, that you're still considering that to be vertical from where it started versus having to see some type of pronounced vertical exposed, as you would in a step or where it's something, an escarpment, or where something was cut out. The mere fact it's rising is considered a step-like function. Um, yeah, based on the current guidelines that are used by the Coastal Commission staff and in their advice to the Coastal Commission, which are the Dr. Johnson uh, guidelines, and um, based on his uh, analysis of this particular set of site circumstances. Um, and I would point out, again, that even in his guidelines, he's, he points out that Different people can look at, at these site circumstances and, and come to different conclusions about how you apply those regulations, but um, it seems clear to staff that um, based on all of the evidence in the record that we've looked at, in term, including all of the detailed geologic information that's site-specific that was generated for the project. So we, do, we did look at the, you know, the, the site-specific information as well. Okay. Uh, he uses the word conservatively before his conclusion, and then he talks about clearly. So uh, uh, when I saw conservatively, is that subject to interpretation or some other valuation? But then he comes back to say clearly with a bluff. But that's convincing enough for staff that he's really made that conclusion. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, yes, we've uh, had consultation with him on several occasions, and this is the most recent, but um, he, has, uh, he has clearly had that same conclusion on each occasion, and he has looked at all of the, the technical information. And so um, that is Dr. Johnson's conclusion is, is what staff has been using uh, for this analysis. Okay. Did, he, uh, did he have a chance to see any of the applicant's assertions in I don't know if that's normal procedure you go to to see if he sees something of value in there or or not in what the applicant is saying. Um, we did forward that all that information, the most recent information, to him, um, and we haven't had an opportunity to, to talk with him since that was, was just a few days. Okay, but there would have been, prior to the mitigated neck deck, there would have been some information that he would be given on a similar vein relative to... All of that information um, through the environmental process, um, he was, he had available to him, yes. Okay. And I think in his memo, he indicated his, that he had reviewed that. Okay. Uh, if we can, uh, I don't know if there's any more questions. I just wanted to take a five-minute break, if we can, uh, to before we get back to comments from the commission and see how we go uh, motion-wise. So uh, let's just give ourselves seven minutes. We'll be back uh, promptly at a quarter to two when I'll put the mic back on. Thank you. Thank you. 
if we can take our seats. Okay, uh, reconvening our uh, meeting, and on the item that we are currently uh, have been discussing and had the presentations, we've had our questions asked and answered. Uh, if there are no other questions, then the next item we would go to uh, would be comments from the commissioners on the uh, SCD that is before us and how we would like to approach that. So uh, looking for comments, Mr. Commissioner Thompson, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, this has certainly been an interesting and unique project in, uh, in many respects. There's no doubt that the project I proposed could be built on this site. Uh, the technology as described by uh, Mr. Shires is uh, uh, he so eloquently showed how this could stabilize the site. The technology has existed for decades. We can build houses on a cliff face if we want to. The technology is there. <clears throat> so if this project was built on the uh, proposed site as proposed, it will stabilize the site and make it safer. Uh, right here in the city, we can go look in Sycamore Canyon and see how Caltrans stabilized Sycamore Canyon after a landslide within the last 10 years using caissons and grade beams and tiebacks. So it's, it's not new technology. So I have no doubt that uh, this project could be safely built. My question is, and the question before us then, should it be built on this site? And that depends on the location of the top of bluff which we've been spending most of the last three meetings talking about. We've received numerous reports and heard a lot of uh, testimony about it. And, and I've read all those reports at least three times, maybe more. Uh, we have two well-qualified experts that have widely differing opinions as to where the top of bluff is. And contrary to Mr. Kaufman's uh, Assertion I consider Dr. Johnson to be an expert. Uh, so obviously there's enough ambiguity in the wording of the law for two different experts to come up with two different opinions. But after reviewing all the evidence, all the reports, and considering the intent of the city's LCP and the intent of the Coastal Act, I find that the top of the Coastal Bluff is as staff has depicted at 127 feet. And thus, it does not meet our CDP Section 8.2. So then this uh, situation is uh, muddled by and complicated by staff recommending that even though it doesn't comply with our LCP, that we should make findings to avoid a regulatory taking. So we're to presume that a 3,000 square foot house in the location as proposed is the only option for this site, and I disagree. I don't believe that this commission has get, been given enough information to make that determination. Um, even going so if you wonder why I say that, for one thing, how much due diligence was done before this site was even purchased for this purchase, purpose, when it was for decades earmarked as an unbuildable site? So we don't have the uh, enough information to make that determination. So at the appropriate time, after all the other commissioners have had their discussion, deliberation, I'm ready to support a denial of the project and request staff to return with findings supporting the denial but eliminating findings 7, 8, and 9. Commissioner Jordan. Ah, struggling to read 789 really fast to see what you're saying. Um, 
No, I, I pretty much mirror uh, Commissioner Thompson's comments up until he won't step through my door, so to speak. Um, I think I clearly, to me, this is a uh, a house envelope that is being built where staff says it's being built at, that the uh, bluff face is at 127. And clearly, I think that staff has um, assessed the, the, the risk and reward of using the Coastal Act uh, relief legislation and decided that the risk is too high to um, not offer that for this particular site. Um, the reason I asked so many questions, or the reason I asked a couple questions about the single family design board review is that I, I still don't think this is an, well, this is, this is an aberration in 21 years of Mr. Vincent's uh, history that we don't review houses and what they're going to look like built on, built past the bluff face. And, but we just, we put it through a normal process. You know, um, that aside, I think the, the house itself for being a 3,000 square foot house is remarkably hidden from any direction that you view it, whether it's from the beach, whether it's from the neighbors, or whether it's from the street. Um, I agree with Commissioner Thompson that today's technology will uh, improve the dynamics of what's going on there on the hillside, and I by uh, Mr. Shire's uh, presentation. I think it's the second time I've seen you, and I think I commented before that you're the kind of guy we should have in front of us constantly on complicated subject matters like this. But I buy the part of the presentation that not only will that uh, protect uh, downhill from the house, or uphill from the house, it's also going to protect downhill from the house uh, as a result of this. And then it also has the added benefit of protecting the city sewer line, offering the easements to the rest of the community. Um, you know, I'm still, um, I don't know, just I'm troubled still by the amount of work and the perception of uh, being hand in hand with the coastal, or a, a member of the coastal commission to get us to the point where we assess the line at 127, but then we haven't determined whether the jump to the regulatory relief is also credible with the Coastal Commission, too. I get the distinction that that's not our concern, but it is actually part of the determination that's being made today. So... Um, I would, I, um, contrary, I will, I, uh, contrary to the last part of uh, Commissioner Thompson, I would say that this is an appropriate method out of the situation given what's been presented today. I would differ from the applicant's um, presentation in that uh, I'm going to still say the City's findings for the top of the bluff face are what they are. Um, they're not what you guys say they are, so I wouldn't remove that. And um, that section on, on uh, truck trips, I think, is in there for a reason for that particular neighborhood. That's a, uh, a dead-end street. Um, Oliver is a very, very – I, I live three blocks over the other direction, so – Oliver is a very, very tough street going downhill for watching speeds. There's a lot of traffic. There's a lot of people walking back and forth. And I think uh, making sure that uh, truck times are regulated for safety and to keep out of the way of the neighborhood would be important. And in addition, um, I'd be interested in what, uh, what the other commissioners are going to say, depending upon which way they go. But I, I, I also, you know, despite the assurances of what modern technology is, I'm still kind of of the opinion that, uh, that it's more uh, we'll measure it and we'll see if there's a problem. But we really haven't, you really haven't explained to me very well what you do when there is a problem other than decide if you can afford a more expensive machine. Um, so I'd be, I'd be interested both in um, protecting the neighbors from noise. So there's a section in there somewhere in 
in N4 that uh, that had some times, and I don't think I agree with those times, but I would like something more like uh, 8 to 4 Monday through Friday for noise generating and no Saturday or Sunday. And then um, I'd be interested in hearing a discussion on whether uh, northeast and west sound barriers are needed or if the applicant could come up with a method to not if not having to barrier the whole the whole site, but just burying burying the noise generation machinery, and that would be some kind of mobile set of walls that could move around that type of thing. Um, that again, it's a real sleepy, quiet industry. You have the um, the burden of being on a on a bluff face, immediately facing whatever, three or four other backyards and people's quality of life. And, it is, and, I, and I still don't think, despite the assurances, I don't think it's a normal construction project. It's not, it's, it, there's, there's just too much going on here. I don't understand that I would prefer to err on the side of protecting the quality of life while construction's going on. And if that causes you some inconvenience with your contractors, if that causes you to extend a little bit of time. I think that's the least you can do for the considerations you're being given. You know, you've used all the phrases about um, um, sig significant, um, about mitigation for significant impacts, and it's really not about significant impacts. It's about what are what are really adverse effects of your actions, and and I think you get wrapped up in the EIR. And I want to get out of that EAR and just talk about what would a reasonable person do to minimize those adverse ref effects. And certainly your, your truck times, your noise generating hours, and when the noise is generated, having some type of barrier to ensure that that noise isn't transmitting to other properties. We did the same. I think we did the same on the St. Francis project. I know we did the same on the project some uh, might have been the cancer project or a medical project by the preschool neck across the street from the hospital, okay? And to me, this is the same, this rises to the same level of worrying about those adverse effects. Um, there's several people in the room. I really um, I respect their opinions, and the next time we're sitting at each other's table having a beverage or something i'd just like to say I, I agree with you this is this this the the placement of this house and the position we find ourselves in is kind of like a bad dream um but i'm really I, i'm really thinking that there's not a good way out for the city unless somebody wants to start having bake sales at the end of mesa lane and raise three hundred thousand dollars to be ready for the city's potential liability down the road if we say no that's, that's how clear it seems to me. So I'd be interested in hearing what uh, other commissioners have to say and see where this uh, ends up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, sorry about the order. Commissioner Lodge. Okay, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I agree uh, in, in whole with uh, Commissioner Thompson's comments. I agree with the ones of Ms. Commissioner Jordan's about the noise issues and the conditions. I want to add that looking at the whole area, uh, there was a big landslide in the 20s. There was another one in the 30s. There was 1978. And granted, it's been what, 32 years since the 1978 one and the monitoring devices since 2011, I think it was said, have shown no movement there. But if you go five to the fifth property to the east of 1925, there's another landslide where there was a house once upon a time. And it is several feet down from where it used to be, and the house, the house was destroyed. Uh, I just see that area. I, I see a geologic hazard, a safety issue there. But it's not. It's probably. It's not. It's probably not imminent. So, but anyway, I, I just. I can't make the findings to uh, approve this project. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Pujol. 
Thank you. I also agree with Commissioner Thompson, Thompson and also Commissioner Lodge in their, in their view. Um, I am not going to be able to support all of the findings. I'm also concerned, I guess I would add, in the precedent that this sets um, in, in several ways. The precedent in the location along this area of the bluff, because there is at least one other vacant property next door, um, but also in the use of 30010 when we really are using it as, if approved, an escape valve without really the test that we need for information and, and documentation that really needs to be behind supporting such a thing. And, and we fall short in many areas on that one. We don't have a study of alternatives. We don't have economic information about what the investment-backed expectations were. And that provision, the way I see it, is a last stopgap. It isn't an excuse for not paying attention to the policies that are in place. And I cannot myself find um, consistency with the um, policy 8.2. Um, so I will not be able to support the project. And, and I, uh, in addition to that, and I don't think that this is necessarily something shared by the other commissioners here, but I also did not support the use of a negative declaration when that was before us um, several weeks ago. And I also, in addition to the policies, I cannot find adequacy in use of the current environmental document, and I don't believe that it did adequately address the um, potential significant impacts, and I believe that it should have been a document that explored alternatives. Commissioner Higgins. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I, I'm uncomfortable as well with 30,010. Um, we're not, uh, you know, we've been given very little information um, about the applicant's um, due diligence or purchase. There's, there's, no, we don't know what information was given, if, if at all, to the applicant when they did or didn't come into the city to do their due diligence. Any warning signs or precautionary tales, or was there a ZIR that was done? We don't, we don't really know a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of information in that regard, so, so I can't go there now. Personally, I would never, <clears throat> you know, just look at the project or the property site, and it looks like you'd be crazy to try to build there. But um, that's not an uh, applicable standard, my, my um, characterization of crazy. So we have to, I think that the bur burden of proof is, is pretty heavy on um, the substantial evidence. And I, I thought it was interesting in the, um, some of the materials that um, – Coastal Commission staff or geologists uh, provided us or were attachments to his letter were the early on characterizations of coastal bluffs where they talk about um, anything within a thousand feet seaward of a uh, thousand feet inward inland um, excuse me to quote a distance of a thousand feet may seem arbitrary this definition generally includes those bluffs where consideration of significant hazards or scenic resources are important. So the Coastal Commission wants to reach as far as they can, but specifically as it relates to scenic resources and, and hazards. And we don't, I don't believe we have those issues here um, as uh, described in the MND and the project application. The, um, the, the thing that, that troubles me with regard to the substantial evidence issue is, is in the reliance on the other properties out there um, is that we don't have a section like this on all of those other properties. So we don't even, in our materials, we don't have a narrative that describes how those uh, bluff top determinations were made. We don't have a section or illustration 
that uh, gives us what I think uh, Mr. Shires described as, as the other properties downward gradients of other risers or step-like features. So that seems to be a missing uh, link for me. Um, the Doolittle uh, permit, although staff uh, characterize that as not necessarily authorizing development by, by pointing out that further studies would be required of that property, um, no kidding. I mean, uh, of course they did. They, they wanted, for a residential permit, you need to have all kinds of studies. But it certainly didn't say that a residential development was prohibited based on the bluff face. So that's kind of another question in my mind, too. So I, I, I can't get behind the fact that there's substantial evidence that 127 is a bluff face. And I also can't support the, the, the rest of the project with regard to the takings, 8, 9, and 10. So I don't know what we're, we're going to do here. Thank you. Uh, see, I agree with Mr. Thompson that the technology is there today. Uh, I believe what I saw relative and, and have heard relative to improvement that would occur on the site, uh, that it would stabilize the site. Uh, I am not in favor of making a decision based upon the potential of some legal issue and claim. And we'd actually, uh, I guess, in our, in our near-term lifetimes here, that we'd be setting a precedent of some type of making that decision. Uh, the other alternative, of course, is to uh, there's denial of the project outright, and then there's approval of the project with a, I would guess, an inconsistency with LCP 8.2 uh, without worrying about a finding of uh, some type of action. But the the problem is we're, we're not really, we're not the Coastal Commission, we're not the interpreters of local coastal plans. We want to see that things comply, but the exception level, I think, to say, well, we know we set up these rules in the past, but that was because there was only slab on grade grading, uh, grading and people really didn't take care to protect the slopes. And maybe things have changed, and maybe if we looked at this on an exception basis, we'd come to another decision because these are guidelines. But unfortunately, I don't feel comfortable being the one to try to go down that road. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, I guess if I were at Coastal Commission, I would think def differently because that's where the rules are made and where, that's where the intentions are. So I feel like a little bit in a box. I appreciate the project. I know what they're trying to do. But at the same time, going against local policy, I guess I have to stand uh, with the staff and not trying to violate that. And as you can tell, I was looking at uh, fishing a little bit on definitions and uh, you know, can things be looked at one way or another? But uh, the consultant for Coastal was pretty adamant and uh, where he was. Uh, and I've got to respect that and not try to make an exception as that one alternative. And I don't believe in the approving for the suit. So unfortunately, I'm, I'm just going to have to uh, go with some of the other commissioners on a denial. Um, so if someone wants to make a motion, we will entertain it. Okay, well, um, I, I'll move to deny the project, um, the inability to make the findings, including the um, Coastal Act and local coastal plan policies. Is, any, is that enough, or do we, I mean, it's a, for a denial finding? Um, Mr. Chair, could you uh, cite which findings you cannot support? We have 10 of them. Which finding? Okay. Um, all right, finding, finding number six on the local coastal plan policy 8.2. That's the primary one. Um, I don't think we have a finding for a 301, do we? I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I would second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Yeah, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Higgins. Oh, go ahead. I just want to, um, I guess the, the, where this is headed and how it's been set up for us clearly illustrate to me that if staff thinks that, that we can make the findings for 30,010 
and we don't, then we're setting, us, we're setting ourselves up to have our uh, clock cleaned or pockets picked with regard to the lawsuit. Um, if, we, if we do, then maybe um, the applicant is, uh, you know, can pick a fight with the coastal uh, staff or their, their commission, and, and that's where that lawsuit lands. I guess I just um, – it's it seems ironic to me that we have an ND that clearly illustrates that the project is safe, um, hidden, an improvement to other properties in the area, so it's a, it's a benefit out there. It's technically feasible and a benefit, and so – uh, with regard to the substantial evidence thing, you, you really have to have convincing evidence that it's at 127. Even coastal staff says it's open to, to interpretation. And we have, in my opinion, uh, a lack of substantial evidence. So I, I'd, I'd be in favor of approving the project, and uh, that's then going to be uh, that, that conversation that we're having uh, discomfort with is going to happen then at the Coastal Commission where perhaps they don't feel the discomfort that we do. Mr. Chair. I would like to speak to the motion um, as far as rather than just um, making a bare assertion that the inconsistency uh, is with 8.2, I'd recommend that you, that you make the finding, finding number six that's listed in your staff report. It's on page 15 of the staff report. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Finding, finding number I, six. I don't page understand 15. what Mr. Vincent just said. Rather, it, the, the motion right now is to deny the project based on, the, on an inability to make the required findings to approve ah. the project. And then Commissioner Pujo said, that she finds it the project to be inconsistent with Section 8 point, uh, Policy 8.2 of the c city's LCP, I would recommend, rather than that particular finding, that you make a more complete finding right. that not only is it inconsistent okay. with 8.2, but it is inconsistent with 8.2 because of a determination that the bluff edge is at 127. Okay. Let me read the proposed language of Finding 6 in the staff report. The project is inconsistent with LCP policy 8.2, no development on a bluff face, because the top of the bluff, bluff edge, has been determined to be located at the 127-foot elevation, and the proposed development would be located at a lower elevation, i.e., on the bluff face. So if the second on the motion would be willing to accept that language, um, I would propose to, to change the the language to, to all of that. Okay. Commissioner Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to clear something up in my mind that Commissioner Higgins said. And, uh, if we approve this today and it was not appealed, there is no action by the Coastal Commission, correct? If we approve this today, well, whatever we did today, and it was appealed to the City Council, if the City Council approved it, there is still no action by the Coastal Commission. Mr. Only Chair. if they no. deny it, right? If no. they deny it, then there's action. No. Right? It's the other way around, The actually. other way around? Correct. If the Council approves it, then okay. it can be appealed. Would, would somebody start at the beginning? Oh. So, Do you mind, Commissioner Jordan? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, can you start? Can Commission. you repeat it? One more time. Thanks. In the positive. <laughs> The action here is appealable either way. If the city council approves the project at the, on appeal, it is then again appealable to the Coastal Commission. If the city council denies the project on appeal, then there is no appeal from that decision to the Coastal okay. Commission. So in either one of those situations, if it doesn't rise to Coastal Commission review because of those, those reasons, then the determine the what I'm calling the determination of the use of uh, three zero zero one zero rests here or rests with the council. Doesn't go any further, correct? Yeah, that's not what you said, though, right? If Mr. Chair, if the the council, if regardless of what happens here, if it gets appealed to the city council, 
city council will again have its own choice in making the determination of whether or not the bluff edge and therefore the bluff face that the project is on the bluff face. If they could make a different determination as to the bluff edge and there would be no policy inconsistency with 8.2. They could then approve the project without having to use 30,010. If they find the same finding that the bluff edge is at 127, therefore the proposed project is on is being proposed on the bluff face, they could still elect to use 30,010 themselves to approve the project despite the inconsistency. That decision then could be appealed by somebody else to the Coastal Commission, and they would have to make their determination on I guess my long way around on that is what I'm saying is there is more than one opportunity for it not to go to the Coastal Commission as shown by staff's recommendation. You are actually, I mean, I'm, the only way it doesn't get to the Coastal Commission is if it's denied by the City Council. Or approved by us and not appealed. Two ways. I don't see that right. happening, but yeah. okay. More than one. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, are there any other comments on the motion, discussion on the motion? Okay. If not, uh, we have a first and a second. We've had our, excuse me. Oh, okay. You're just getting ready to vote. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Commissioner Thompson. Aye. Commissioner Jordan? No. Commissioner Lodge? Aye. Commissioner Higgins? I'm sorry, can you repeat the motion? Okay. It was to deny the project with the inability to, to um, have consistency with LCP policy 8.2 because of the determination that the top of the bluff edge was not. Um, Is that 127 foot mm -hmm. elevation? No. Okay. And, not to leave you out, um, Vice Chair Peugeot? Yes. Okay. And Chair Campanella? Yes. We have four ayes, and it's denied. It's denied. Okay. There would be a... This, yes, this decision is appealable within 10 days. Within 10 days, correct. Thank you. Calendar days or work days? Calendar. 10 calendar days. And you can bet it will be. Tomorrow. <laughs> of course, yeah. I'm big on private property. Okay, right? uh, but we're, uh, next would be administrative agenda. Any staff hearing officer report today? Uh, nothing really to report out of the ordinary last week. Um, I went to ask staff. There was out of the four or five items last week at uh, staff hearing officer, one of them was denied, has, and that has not been appealed that you know of? It has not been appealed yet. Yeah. Okay. Has another day or two, it I may guess, be, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any other reports? Commissioner Lodge? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Historic Landmarks Commission uh, established... Uh, if we can, please. Thank you. We're not finished. Thanks. The Historic Landmarks Commission, because of their difficulties in approving the... Uh, dealing with priority overlay projects and high-density projects in the um, El Pueblo Viejo, uh, created a subcommittee to look at the issues... They had two meetings, and then the whole HLC yesterday discussed the issues. Uh, they, they see many different issues, but decide, things that perhaps should be changed in the ordinance, but knowing that that would be a rather lengthy process, and uh, having staff presented the draft guidelines, which would give them more opportunity to make the projects compatible uh, to, the, to their settings, uh, they are working on going ahead with that, and the subcommittee is going to be meeting again, uh, and the HLC as a whole also wants to continue at the same time pursuing a change in the map to eliminate some of the areas where the properties are very close proximity to historic resources. 
So they are they are working on that that issue, um, seeing that adjustments do need to be made. Okay. Any other uh, comments, Commissioner Thompson? Yeah. At the airport commission meeting last week, the commission discussed the upcoming uh, airport uh, draft master plan EIR, and uh, they took an action to, uh, and they will be coming to present it to us, to uh, put a caveat on the five historic structures that are on the airport that are identified in the EIR as being potential structures of merit. Uh, as of right now, they don't need to remove any of those because the uh, expansion of the airport hasn't reached the point where they would need to, but they want to be on record that at some point in the future, if expansion per the master plan needs to go forward, that they support the proper removal and documentation of those potentially historic structures. So they'll be here to present that to us at the meeting next week. Okay, uh, so if there's nothing else, we are adjourned to September 1st. Is that correct? That's our next meeting. Yep. Okay. Thank you.